This is off planet radio. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Emily Moyer. Randy has the evening off, but have no fear. I have a wonderful guest, and we are going to have a great time. It's been a couple of weeks. Things have been a little uh, crazy. I've been traveling a little bit and just uh, going through some interesting personal uh, transformations and uh, rejection of technology, which makes it hard to do a show, but I've overcome that for the evening, and I am really happy to have my good buddy and partner in crime, Robert Phoenix, with me here, and we are going to uh, go over the, 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 the news of the week and then get right down to something that needs to be gotten down to, because it's been a long time coming, and we are going to look into what on earth or who on earth is Joe Rogan, <laughs> because he's a kind of an enigma, and he's become sort of a sacred cow, and... Um, we don't do sacred cows here. So, Robert Phoenix, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Emily, hey, it's always great to be here with you and get into a little mischief together. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, before we get into the meat, the meat, uh, the meat of the, the show, let's just, lots of stuff has been happening. Um, let's kind of go through just sort of uh, where we're at astrologically and maybe talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that have happened in the last couple of weeks. Asia Argento, John McCain, I mean, maybe do a little... U.S. Open chat for a minute, whatever. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> yeah, the Asia Argento stuff. You know, I did, a, I did a pretty kind of deep dive on her and Bourdain and their charts. And, uh, you know, there, I mean, there's just so much to unpack there. You know, I, I, I essentially feel based on her relationship with him, both astrologically and personally, well, first of all, they were into some deep and weird shit together. I mean, they were, they, they, I mean, I think he had really crossed over the line and embraced the dark side through Asia Argento. Mm -hmm. And she became, you know, like astrologically, um, her black moon Lilith was, I believe, right on Bourdain's moon. Like, so they, they have like this really very dark, occultic relationship and and i feel like almost as if she was like some kind of a, a succubi to him mm -hmm. and that there was less and less and less and less and less of his life force mm -hmm. that was available and he became in my estimation like this this wicker man yeah that that's what he became and well, there's a whole backstory now that's beginning to emerge. Hi, Jasper. And Jasper he has to get on. Of right? course. Uh, he, you know, he, he knows it's showtime, man. I don't know what's up with this cap. So there's a whole backstory beginning to emerge, and it has to do with this kid, Jimmy Bennett. And it's incredibly bizarre. You know, most people know that Jimmy Bennett actually, ex for, for lack of a better term, extorted Asia Argento for the tune of about $300,000. Mm -hmm. Now there are Hollywood insiders who know Jimmy Bennett and his parents who seem completely amoral and totally corrupt and that they would have pimped their kid out yeah. at, at any, at any level, at any time. And his first big movie role came with Argento in a film called um, uh, the heart is deceitful above all things. Yeah. And it was part of a short story and a longer story written by J.T. Leroy. And a lot of people may remember that J.T. Leroy was a fictional character. And, uh, and he was supposedly this young kid who had been snatched up by his mother who became a truck stop hooker. And it's a complete line fabrication. And in fact, the movie, The Heart is Deceitful Above All Things, is based on 
this J.T. Leroy story, right, which was written by a woman. Um, I've got to get her name since we're, we're into, like, being exact. We're going to deep dive and be exact on lots of things tonight, guys. So we got to be exact, man. It's Virgo month, okay? Well, we decided Can't fuck next, around with Virgo. We decided next time, like, we have such interesting conversations before the show starts, that next time we're just going to record the conversation and screw the show. <laughs> so J.T. Leroy... Uh, J.T. Terminator Leroy was actually the creation of Laura Albert. And her boyfriend's sister, who looked very kind of unisexual, actually played J.T. Leroy. So when they would have to go, and, and J.T. Leroy was incredibly famous. I mean, you know, Johnny Depp loved the stories and loved J.T. Leroy and um, Marilyn Manson and Bill, Billy Cor you know, Corgan. I mean, everybody who was counterculture loved these stories because it was so gritty, so real. This kid had been through so much pain and trauma. It was a big fucking lie. Yeah. It was a total lie. Laura Albert wrote these stories, uh, pretended to be JT Leroy, and it was kind of a, a major con. <laughs> and they kept getting away with it and getting away with it and getting away with it. She would dress her, her boyfriend's sister up, and who was, again, very unisex looking, make him look like a guy. People didn't really kind of question very much about it. They had to bring her out to these, you know, they went to Cannes together, for crying out loud. And this is, where, this is the level of, of the deceit that they were pulling off. Wow. And in some ways, um, I kind of like what um, Laura Albert did because she exposed this celebrity culture, which is so fucking fake and phony totally. that they bought in to a completely phony persona, hook, line, and sinker, right? It was like they were consuming one of their own. It was really fascinating from that level. So out of this comes this movie uh, called The Heart is Deceitful Above All Things. And Asia Argento was really adamant. Like that was her project. She was going to produce it. She's going to direct it. And she did. She starred in it. She had, you know, some interesting people. Jeremy Renner is in it. Peter Fonda is in it. And this kid, Jimmy Bennett, is in it. And at that time, Jimmy Bennett was around seven or eight years old. So this is her first connection with Jimmy Bennett and Jimmy Bennett's family. So Jimmy Bennett plays her son in the movie. And the movie is brutal. The book is brutal. There's all kinds of drug use and violence and the incest. I mean, it's, it, it is a, a kind of a drag by the collar through the American sewer or the sewers of America, yeah. say, circa mid-90s. Right. The truth, yes. It's what it is, right? Yeah. Heroin culture, speed culture, um, you know, dangerous sex culture. And what's interesting about the the, the – the premise of the film is that Asia Argento, who plays the mother, pulls Jimmy Bennett, her son, out of a foster home. And the foster home is actually the most stable thing in his life. Right. Which is kind of odd because in many cases, foster homes are anything but stable, right? So they're kind of selling the foster home as this, you know, okay place to have your kids. Uh, but really, a lot of us know that that's really not the case. So she becomes this... Um, almost like a, you know, Mother Mary figure. I mean, I, I think she probably saw herself as kind of a Mother Mary figure with, J, uh, with this Jimmy Bennett. Well, then she crosses over into Mary Magdalene because she has a series of, like, you know, encounters with him over the years. Now, she said that he was 17 when he, she seduced him. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Of course, in Europe... Um, 16 is the age of consent, but it didn't happen in Europe, it happened in California. So she has <laughs> sex with this kid that she knows that she was seven years old. That's disgusting. I mean, that's just disgusting. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's not probably not a good idea to be an adult woman having sex with a 17 year old boy, but one you've known since they were seven. Like, I just, I can't imagine having sex with like a kid that I, I that I know I've known you know, that I'm much older than that I've known since they were seven, you know? Right. So I can't imagine it. Yeah. If you if you waited till, you know, five minutes after the kid's 18th birthday, male or female, 
are they going to really like pop in some like amazing a level of awareness in those five minutes? <laughs> no, it's doubtful. Right. So when you're getting a 17 year old, especially 17 year old boy, you're getting kind of close to an 18 year old. And I'm not advocating you go out and have sex with a 17 year old. It's against the law, but having this kid and kind of, you know, farming him. Yep. Right. So what happens is um, his career begins to peter out. This is according to the Hollywood insiders. So he made about $2 million, two and a half million dollars off of his film career, something like that. And it's doubtful that his parents were all that productive. Right. So they were probably looking at Asia Argento as being somebody who could, um, you know, stock the coffers a little bit. Yeah. So he says to Asia Argento, look, you know, you screwed me up. Having sex with me, you, you totally screwed me up. He was born in 77. So what does that make him now? What is he, 20? If he's born in 77, then he's 41. Because no, 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 he's younger than that. Younger than that. He's born in 97. I think he was born in 97. Let me, let me look if he's, up. If he's born in 97, then he's 21 now. Let me look at, let me look at Jimmy Ben. Hold on. Again, we got to so, be. You know what? I, I, and this is just completely an aside, but I, I keep thinking whenever I hear her name, because I had never really heard of her until this whole thing happened with, with Anthony Bourdain. I don't, you know, even though I live here, I don't pay much attention to this shit. But yeah. her name is Asia Argento, and Argento means silver. Yeah. Right? Is this some yeah, sort silver. Of code? We, we talked about that, right? Is this some sort of code for Asia has all the silver and they're the ones manipulating the silver market? Is that what this well, is? Code I, don't, for? I don't know about that. It could be, but you know, silver is the devil's currency. Right. Because Judas sells Jesus out for 40 pieces of silver. Right. So yeah. there's symbology going on here somewhere, whether it's, you know, practical symbology or just more metaphoric. Exactly. Yeah. Um, he's 22. He was born in 1996. Okay. So he sends a series of letters and texts or whatever to Asia Argenta while she's with Bourdain. Okay. So this is over with the last two years roughly since they were together and basically says, look, I want $300,000 because you fucked me up. And she gone for more. <laughs> well, she goes to Bourdain. Now the rumor is, is that, that he paid the entire thing. I've heard or through, I read through Asia Argento, whatever this is worth, that he paid for 200,000 and she paid for 100,000. So whether it's him paying for 200 or 300, doesn't matter. He's paying extortion money yeah. to this kid that she had sex with. Now, her, her, the nickname that they had for Jimmy Bennett was Donkey. That was his, that was his nickname that they shared between the two of them. And one could only imagine what donkey might mean. Right. <laughs> you know, what if, what if Asia Argento saw this kid around seven or eight and, you know, looked at him and said, man, this kid's a donkey, right? And had that in the back of her head. I mean, the whole thing is just weird. Very strange. Yeah. So they paid him off. So, Anthony Bourdain is like looking worse and worse posthumously. And Asia Argento is like kicking dirt on his grave. I mean, one of the things she could have said was, yeah, the amount, the money that we paid him, the money that I paid him, that's a very private matter. Like, does that, does she need to go out and basically say, uh, you know, Bourdain either paid 200K or 300? I mean, how's Bourdain's wife going to feel ex-wife and kid. I mean, I mean, this is classic Asia Argento. Right. With this whole thing. Well, she's just, I, I don't know much about her, but when I just look at her, I'm like, this person is not, is this is a sick person. She, she, she reminds me of somebody who's desperately trying to be 15, 17 or 16. All well, there's just, she looks so vacant to me. So hollow. So just, there, I saw some picture of her today with Rose McGowan and just looking at them, it's just like, I mean, it's gross. They, they, they don't look like normal human beings. Speaking of Rose McGowan, she's now flipping and taking yeah. Bennett's side. 
Yeah, well, she's, I heard her say that she's devastated by, by what she learned about Asia Argento and whatever. Please. Right. Please. Give me a break. Yeah. They're both, they're, they're both liars. They're both liars. She said, oh, I've only known her for 10 months. But there's a picture of the two of them that goes all the way back to 2010. Of course. They got their arms around each other and they're hanging out. She's known her for an incredibly long time. Yeah. Come on. They're witches. Yeah. They get witchy poo together. Well, I bet you this, and I don't think this is a surprise. This is the other side of the Me Too movement. This is the, right? They, they, they worked that angle for a while, and now it's going to be sort of expose the other side of it. It's always more revelation of the method, externalization of the hierarchy. None of these cats are clean. That's right. Absolutely. And, you know, now we're getting into this continued desensitization around yep. kids and child sex and oh, well, it's okay to, you know, have sex when they're 16 in Europe. You know, if, right. she, if she brought them over to, to Roma, it wouldn't have been a problem, right? right? Well, and it brings up, it started to bring up all the stuff about Roman Polanski again, right? Like in all these articles, they were all talking about, oh, you know, this whole thing with Roman Polanski, and then it's been brought up that, like, you know, how Meryl Streep is, you know, and, and some of these other people who everybody loves, they were all sort of part of the campaign to get Roman Polanski out of jail when he was in jail for a brief time and whatever. And how Hollywood really has always been very uh, accepting, if not pro pedophile. And so for them to feign any kind of outrage at this point is hilarious. Yeah. No, I, I would, I would totally agree. But if you see pictures of, uh, or, and, if you see pictures of Jimmy Bennett now, uh, he looks really fucked up. Yeah. And he's got, you know, sort of bleach blonde hair with magenta kind of running through it. And um, he's, he's, he's not a smoking cigarette. I mean, he looks like he's, he looks messed up. I want to see. You know, and whether or not it was Asia Argento or his parents, Hollywood, combination of everything, you know, I'm it, looking at Jimmy Bennett. No, of course, there's no. Terrible. When I look up Jimmy Bennett, there's just pictures of Asia. Okay, so I'm seeing old pictures of Jimmy Bennett. I haven't seen any of the recent pictures. I mean, he was a cute kid. Very cute kid. Yeah. Very cute kid. There's a recent picture of him at a hotel, and he's wearing a t-shirt or sweatshirt um, that says "fuck off," and um, he's got a cigarette. He just, you know. All you the look, pictures that I'm seeing of him looks, look like they're probably from 18 or younger. He looks pretty yeah. young. No, he's, he's done a turn. He's, you know, he's, you could tell he's in a, in a dissonant phase. Yeah. Oh, I see it. I see it. Oh, he looks terrible. Doesn't it look bad? Yeah, really bad. Yeah, really I mean, bad. He, looks, he looks like, he looks like a, a girl social justice warrior, right? <laughs> right? When you see all the girls like at protests, like the overweight chicks with the pink hair and shit screaming and yelling, that's sort of what he looks like, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 try, and, try, and trying to kind of emulate Andy Warhol. Yeah. Yeah. A really, yeah, a really messy looking Andy Warhol. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. not great. So this, no. you know, whatever happened to this kid, it's like, it's eaten away at his soul. And this gets back to Asia Argento, who is, has this kind of suck you by, um, quality to her like i think she yeah. sucked the life out of anthony bourdain and um looks like she sucked the life and the innocence out of this kid it's so funny you say this about sucking the life out of anthony bourdain and this ties a little circle back to um where we're going to get to today when we talk about joe rogan but i was actually listening to the joe rogan podcast today he had a very interesting guest on named valentine thomas and she is a former lawyer and financier who left that life behind to become a spearfisher woman, spearfisher to do spearfishing. And it was an interesting conversation, but as always, there was some interesting things in there. Um, but this isn't the most interesting thing. I'll get to that later. But he, she was, they were talking about, you know, the fish, the oceans being overfished and stuff like that. And he, Joe Rogan told the story of, that Anthony Bourdain told him that he was in some place in the, in, um, the Mediterranean or whatever. And they wanted uh, him to 
uh, pretend like like he was pulling fish out of the ocean, but there were no fish in the ocean. So they threw like a frozen octopus in there, right? And and he, they wanted him to pull it out like he was fishing it out, but he ended up exposing them for what they did. But just when you were saying that she's like a succubus who sucked the life out of him, I'm thinking of an octopus with their suckers on. And uh, I don't know if you've heard any of the shows that Nish and I have done together, but we've been talking about this sort of octopi entity that sort of invaded people's consciousness and and has been sort of you know it, it, a recurring theme in, in conversations amongst a lot of people so just when you said that that she's a succubus i thought about this dead octopus thrown in the water that they want him to fake fish out so that the show can be more interesting you yeah. know what i mean yeah, yeah. octopus the succubi right yeah no I, yeah i mean i mean certainly there's some suction going on yeah she looks i mean she looks like she has no like life force of her own. She looks like a vampire. I'd agree with that. I mean, I like, even more than a witch, she looks like a vampire. You know, I mean, the thing that was fascinating about Bourdain, and, but also really disturbing is, you know, he turned on his, um, we, we might've talked about this, but he turned on his longtime cinematographer and a guy that he was really, really close to because Asia Argento wanted him fired. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's almost the equivalent of a sacrifice. Yeah. Like he didn't, he didn't kill him. But he may as well have. He, but he killed, he killed this yeah. guy's spirit. Yeah. And, um, and he did that for her. Yeah. For whatever, whatever, like, you know, prove your love or who knows what. Oh, she looks like, like she's into sacrificing babies and eating, you know, and all that kind of shit. She looks like look, she's into you know, any kind of sacrifice. Like, I can't work with him. I can't work with him. Well, he probably well, had to clean, he needs to go. He right? probably had a clean spirit or a clean soul. Can't work with that shit. Uh, you know, he was he was on a couple of episodes with Bourdain. One where he's he's from New England. He took he took him to where he lives. It's a really sweet episode. Very sweet. And he the other episode that he was on with Bourdain was took place in Spain because during their travels he met a Spanish woman. And um, you know, it's like, hey, look who I met, you know. So this is their culture, their food. And so he took Bourdain. So he showed up on two of the episodes. Very nice guy, very sweet guy, kind of quirky, sort of New England style quirky, you know? Yeah. Um, and he, fi he fired him. You know, and so what happens when we get into bad relationships is that we, we begin to um, sort of cannibalize ourselves. Yep. And we do things that we regret for whatever reason, and we, and we make bad choices over and over and over again because they're being fueled by guilt, anxiety, um, and trying to maybe create some kind of you know, downward momentum that we actually hit bottom and then you know, come out. It's a very Plutonian kind of thing, mm -hmm. actually. And, and sometimes it's really minor, like you know, a family that no longer talks to another part of the family. Right. And it's like the wife says, I can't stand your parents. Or the husband says, I can't stand that, you know, that bitch mother of law of yours. Yeah. Whether it's real or not. And then it keeps going and going and going and going. And all of a sudden there's like this sacrifice that's involved. And they're sacrificing those people and that relationship. And sometimes maybe it's okay to not be a part of the family. Some families are really messed up. Yeah. But there'll be this sacrifice involved so that they can take whatever kind of you know, life force from whatever it is those people are feeling, experiencing, and move it into their life. And, and so I think, you know, and we do this a lot, right? I mean, it happens. But I think she did it with him on that level and then a lot more. Yeah. So by, the, by the time uh, everything sort of collapses around when he finds out that, you know, she's – hanging out with this guy in, where is it, Rome? I think, or was it Rome or, or Paris? I don't, I don't know. The, the journalist, and sees all those pictures. Now, I don't, I don't think, I don't think Tony Bourdain, um, I don't think he killed himself. I don't think he, I don't think he was suicided. But, you know, he had so much going on. Wait, you said you don't think he killed himself? You said you don't think he was suicided. Which one is it? You don't think he killed well, himself? Well, no, okay, I'm sorry. I don't think he, I don't think he committed suicide. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Because there was so much going on. Like, of course, he was, he was, on the one hand, he's like going after the Clintons, right? I mean, this is this whole bizarre thing. About we had all these weird tweets about like Israeli intelligence following him, Black Cube and the Clintons and all this stuff. Yeah. 
he had such a weird end game. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, it was, again, he, you know, he's like on this quest and this crusade for truth and trying to, you know, uncover the Clinton stuff. But at the same time, he's having this like succubi relationship with Asia Argento. And, and, it, uh, and I think it all kind of collapses in on him at the end. And, um, and it, but the end game isn't good. And it's looking even worse now with this Jimmy Bennett thing. Yeah. So yeah. one has to wonder what that, what part this plays in all of that. And it's very interesting, but yeah, you were the first one to really, I mean, I'm sure other people have, but you really, you were on her like a fly on shit from the moment the, this thing happened. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was, yeah. that was easy. Yeah. That was easy. You could, you could just spot her, you know, a prison mile away. Right? Yeah. Guys, go look at her. She looks like a vampire. She really does. Yeah. yeah. She's on an eternal quest to stay about 18 or 19. Yep. That's, that's you know, she's always, you know, playing this coquette. Yeah. You know? It's very dark, very dark coquette. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So speaking of dark coquettes, <laughs> John McCain expired this week. Oh, I thought you were going to go into Serena Williams. I was going to go, well, oh. You better be careful there. No. Some people no. might take offense to that little thing. I was like calling him a cockett because he's a war hawk. You know what I mean? Like a chicken. Well, <laughs> he came as a weird dude. Weird. Did you, and did you see how weird he looked at the end with that head? His head was all weird looking. And like, he looked like Frank. The last picture I saw of him, he looked like Frankenstein, dude. I'm like, that's more the truth, yo. So, so the Q, the, you know, the, the Q, the Q crowd. Oh God. Uh, they claimed that, um, McCain was faking his cancer. Okay. And that he was actually taken out. Okay. That he wasn't, they didn't die of cancer. Well, so they, he could have been given cancer. He could, they, they have all sorts of fast acting shit. Bottom line is he's gone. He's gone. And, and the reaction has been very polarizing. Long. So weird, the reaction. You have people on the left worshiping him like he's a hero for the a lot, for largely. I mean, did you see what the uh, Kuk, uh, Kuk, or Ocasio Cortez said about him? That he was like the model of human decency. <laughs> she's supposed to be like a socialist against the system. This is where you know that she's part of the game too. It is all a huge game. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So he died just what two days before his birthday. So. He was one of those rare people that, you know, almost left and came in and left at the same time. Yeah. So let's see. Today's the 27th. So his birthday's on Thursday, 29th of August. What a, what a, I mean, you know, obviously, like, I don't, I'm not ever happy when someone dies and I don't wish death on anybody or anything like that. But what a, he was just a really disturbing man in so many ways. Um, and just the, the fact that like people, whether you're Republican or Democrat, all these people accepted him, like this was, you know, and accepted him. I mean, the way he would talk about just casually about, you know, bombing countries and invading other countries and all that kind of stuff. This is a person who had absolutely no value for human life. None. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, you know, I, it was a competition. I mean, I think Lindsey Graham outdid him ultimately in the end. In well, he's, he certainly a cared a lot about Al Qaeda. <laughs> he certainly cared a lot about ISIS. Right. He would go hang out with them. Yeah. I mean, plenty of pictures of him over there, sort of, you know. Yeah. Around those dudes. Yeah. Dude, there yeah. were people, there were, there were people, elderly people, who committed suicide because they lost their entire um, savings through the SNL scandal. Yeah. Which he helped. Um, he, he aided and abetted in the whole thing. And, um, you know, they helped out Charles Keating, who was yep. the chairman of Lincoln Savings and Loan, and yep. intervened on his behalf. And, I mean, it was a mess. Alan Cranston, Dennis DiConcini, McCain, John Glenn, yep. uh, Donald Regal. Uh, Glenn and McCain, they, they ran for re-election, and they got their seats. Yeah. Um, but it was bad. You know, essentially, they, they lifted all the controls yeah. on SNLs. Yep. 
And, and then they just said, yeah, you know, okay, go invest all that money. And then wasn't he also involved in some of the stuff with the uh, SS Liberty? That I'm not sure of. The Israel stuff. He was involved with something with some sort of ship, something. Well, okay, so when he was, when he, when he was a maverick, he was a, he was a fighter pilot, right? Right. And when he was a maverick, he was um, in his plane on, on an uh, aircraft carrier. And there is a, you know, a protocol for taking off on an aircraft carrier, which is you start your engine and then you ramp up slowly, 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 slowly. And then you get your engine at a point where it's getting ready to hit as much maximum thrust as, as you can. And then it does. And then you shoot off of a very short runway on an aircraft. You don't have the same amount of runway. So you've got to get like, you know, as, as close to maximum thrust as possible, but you can't do it like, you know, just put your pedal to the metal. Right. He did. So basically what he did was um, he started his, his jet fighter with like all systems go. Everything was like turned on full blast, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, his accelerator was cranked all the way and then he fired the plane. And then when that happened, he shot like a, a flame that was about 30 feet long outside of the plane. And it, it wound up catching the, uh, the aircraft carrier on fire. Mm -hmm. And I think like, like 22 people died or something. It was really bad. Yeah. Really, I mean, really, really bad. I mean, he was being a complete and utter dickhead. Yeah. And, and then he immediately ran out of the plane and was found like cowering somewhere, you know, in the middle of the ship. Meanwhile, people are running around, you know, impersonating the human torch and people are trying to put the fires out. And so, you know, that's, that's where the ship reference comes from. Okay. Yeah. Not great. And he comes from a Naval family. Yeah. His father was a, you know, an admiral's father's father was an admiral. I mean, all that Naval stuff. Yeah. He, he, you know, he went to 30 different schools by the time he finally went into some like boarding. Well, he, was, he was born in Panama as well, right? He was born in Panama, Cologne, yeah. Panama. And um, it's kind of interesting, right? He had, he had Obama who may or may not have been born in Hawaii. Um, and then you had, then you had uh, McCain, who we know wasn't born in the United States. Right. I mean, he was born on those seems, days, right? That, that almost seems like it was intentional. Sure. Uh, he was, but John McCain was born supposedly on a military base, though, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And then they, I'm, sure, I'm sure he was. Yeah. But he went through 30 schools by the time, I think he was around 15, and he finally went to this. Well, they got a lot of different programs they got laid down on him. There's a lot well, of layers. Probably. Probably. Yeah. I mean, one could say, well, of course, you know, it's a naval family. They move all over the place. But he finally went to an academy in um, Virginia, uh, CIA country. Of course. Yeah. So he, he has a very strange kind of rootless upbringing. I mean, imagine that. You're, you've gone to 30 schools by the time you're 15. Right. But if you're, if you're 30 different people inside, then. Could, could be. Yeah. His, his wife, Cindy, comes so from. So disturbing. So she, she is so, I saw a video of her one time where somebody who was a survivor of the SS Liberty confronted her or somebody who knew somebody confronted her and asked her what she thought about, you know, that her husband had done all that and that he kind of denies or ignores it and doesn't say anything about it. She says, Oh, I don't really care about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Sorry. I didn't mean to she, she comes from a major crime family. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe if I'm not mistaken, there are, you know, it's like there are two like major wings of the mafia. There's like the Jewish wing with Meyer Lansky and Dutch Schultz and those people. And then there's the Italian wing. Right. And a lot of people think that the Italian wing answered to people like Meyer Lansky. So her last name is Hensley. So her parents come from like the Jewish wing of the crime mafia. And one of my favorite researchers of all time, Michael Collins Piper, mm -hmm. did a big did a big expose on Cindy Hensley. So this is a quote here. 
It says, um, let me just read a little bit of this. He says, if you still doubt that the big media is deter determined to keep under wraps the organized crime origins of the $200 million fortune of John McCain and his wife, Cindy, he, he inherited, when he married her, $200 million. He inherited it from her family? Yes. Let me read this. Okay. It says, take note of how the prestigious Washington Post to touched on the issue in its July 22nd edition. Rather, instead, note how the Post covered up the matter. The Post reported Cindy Lou Hensley grew up as an only child and a privileged one and a large rancher. Cindy Lou? Good Cindy God. Cindy Lou Hensley <laughs> in an upper class section of Phoenix. Her dad, Jim Hensley, founded what became a large Anheuser-Busch distributorship. And her mom, Marguerite, was a proper belle who emphasized impeccable manners. The Post also almost uh, added almost discreetly that Mrs. McCain's wealth may exceed $100 million, although most sources estimate it is worth $200 million or more, and for the record, that she was the father of her apple's eye. The Post did not mention that Mrs. McCain's father was a highly placed fixture in the Arizona branch of the National Organized Crime Syndicate. He was the chief, chief, hems, chief henchman of the late Kemper Marley, Arizona point man for the infamous mob chief Meyer Lansky, and his powerful partners in crime, the super rich Bronfman family of Montreal. Ah. So in that are capacity, capacity for 40 yeah. years until his death, Marley was the undisputed political boss of Arizona, acting as the behind the scenes power over both the Republican and Democratic parties. As such, his wealth and connections played the primary role in advancing John McCain's political career from the start. Now he goes to this. He says, although, Democrat, although some Democrats have muttered that Mrs. McCain's business interests could impact on her husband's decision making, as president, none has dared cross the line and make reference to the fact this vast, vast wealth was spawned by what, other, other, by, by what others have indelicately, although quite accurately, called the Jewish Mafia. So this is, this is where John McCain's money comes from. It yep. comes through Cindy McCain's father, who is like the henchman, the regional henchman for Meyer Lansky and the Bronfmans in Arizona. Yep. That's how John McCain rose to power. Yeah. Yep. And, that, and that's why he's such a shill for all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. All, right, all right. Well, good riddance to John McCain. You know, like, don't wish it on anybody, but don't let the door hit you on the you way know, out. Like, like my show last night. So, you know, here's what I think. I think we have to get to this place where we can understand these people were complete shits and really were not invested in any remote way, any remote sense of caring for us, right? We have to understand that. And, we, and, and it's actually good to get it out. Yeah. But it's also, I think, important to understand that, you know, whether or not he was even fully human, he was a human at one point. Right. And, yeah. you know, we're all part of this, you, this zoo on this planet together. It is a, it is definitely a zoo. Absolutely. I have no arguments. Yeah. I mean, I have, I mean, with almost very few exceptions, probably almost no exceptions. All of these people that we talk about and that we criticize and that we, you know, don't like and whatever, I do have a level of compassion for them because they are carrying on something that has, that they were born into generally that has been done to them. That has been, you know, like there's no person who's, you know, like he comes from, you know, a family where this was what they do. You're yeah. absolutely right. You're, yeah. It's generational. Yeah, it's generational. It's part of the bloodline. There's no person out there. Pract I mean, I'm not going to say no, but very few people out there practicing mind control or, you know, pedophilia or satanic ritual abuse or any of that shit on somebody who, when it, if it wasn't also done to them, you know? And so I do have a level of compassion for them and I don't wish bad things on them but at a certain point you know just you know 
we all have some level of awareness. We all have some, you know, come back to yourself moment, you know, and it, it is hard to make that decision to transform to, tra you know, because, you know, it's, it's, there is something just so much easier about continuing down the path that you're on. It's, it's hard to change when you don't know what that's going to mean going forward, if people are going to like you or support you, or if you're going to lose your privileges or lose your, you know, specialness or you love what else kind of stuff. But we all have that moment that, you know, make a choice moment and people are responsible for the choice that they make. And I'm sure he's had times in his life where he could have turned and walked the other way and he didn't do that. And so I hold him responsible for that. But I do have a level of compassion for the fact that he probably was, you know, horribly, um, brainwashed, mistreated, mistreated, abused, all that other kind of stuff that he ultimately ended up doing to people, other people. Well, I could have said that better myself. Yeah. And I, and I think the challenge is to um, break through and wake up and know that there are these kinds of, um, you know, road to Damascus moments. Yeah. And you can open your eyes and um, figure it out, or you can just, keep on walking blindly down that path and you deserve what you get at some point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I think we'll skip over the, uh, the U S open and the Serena Williams banter unless we, uh, yeah, I think we'll skip over that and kind of get into sort of the meat of what we're here to talk about. And that is one Joe Rogan. So before we kind of get into this, I just want to be pretty clear that I actually like, I listen to the Joe Rogan podcast from time to time. I used to listen a lot more. Um, there's a part of me that likes Joe Rogan. There's a part of me that enjoys listening to his podcast. Um, but over the years, I have become increasingly suspicious, uncomfortable, um, and just aware of the fact that there is something more going on here. There's something deeper both going on with him personally and then what is sort of being run through his, his show and the sort of transformation he's made informationally um, it, because he's done so many, I mean, he's well into 1200 shows or something like that now. So over that long arc, it, it, it doesn't seem that drastic, but some of these shows are sometimes he records three or four shows a day. Right. So it's happened quicker than, than people might realize. And it's not, you know, he still has, you know, he still has some guests on where I think it's fairly organic. And so, you know, every once in a while you pop into a great show where there's really nothing weird going on there. And you're like, damn, this is just an interesting, interesting show. It's a good show. Right. Um, but if you sort of watch the web that's been woven, especially I'd say in the last five, four or five years, um, something is funny. Something is not kosher at the deli. Um, and, you know, but within that, like I said, I still, I don't, I don't dislike him. I don't even know how super aware he is of this. I mean, he has to be aware on some level. Um, but Robert and I have been talking about this in the background for a little bit. And we decided tonight we would uh, do his chart and take a look at who he is and kind of the person he is and, and why he would find himself in this position. And we're going to do that right now. And then in the second hour, we're going to get into some more of the nitty gritty of what he might actually be and what might actually be going on here. So Robert, let's get into the Joe Rogan experience. Yeah, the Joe Rogan experience. So Joe Rogan was born on August 11th, 1967 in Newark, New Jersey. Now there was no birth time set for him. So I had to kind of piece something together in astrology. They call it rectification and you know, I'm just sort of like looking at some stuff that I think might be meaningful and worthwhile based on life events that I, you know, know superficially about him. Like, for instance, when his show, the Joe Rogan Experience, debuted, and a few other kind of salient points that I think we'll, you'll find interesting as we get into this. So, um, one of the things before I get into his chart that I find really fascinating is that his exact astrological opposite is Alex Jones. Oh, wow. That's well, okay. And they both kind of come from this 
nebulous sacred cow productions that also is loosely affiliated with Bill Hicks and uh, that Kevin, whatever guy who makes the films about marijuana. Yeah, it's, it's Kevin Booth's. Kevin Booth, yes. Uh, me- media company. And he had um, these guys kind of under his, his wing and stable. Yeah. In the, like the Late 90s. 90s. Yeah. And Joe Rogan was one of them. And, you know, they were doing stuff like, um, like videotaking stand-up bits and, um, you know, recordings with, like they didn't have podcasts back then. Right. But it was kind of like a version of podcasts. The precursor, yeah. The precursor and, you know, maybe some bits and, you know, it was, it was think of like a record label in some ways. But well, it's also like with Sacred Cow, it's part of like, that's when Bill Hicks was out there doing stuff at Waco and then Alex Jones was out there on his own doing, that's kind of where those two sort of crossed paths and the confusion started about them it all kind of winds together to this in the same thing, right? This is all sacred cow production. Yeah, right. Ex- exactly. Exactly. So, and, and uh, Kevin Booth was, and, and still is the, you know, the mastermind mm-hmm. and the link between Joe Rogan, Bill Hicks, um, and Alex Jones. Mm-hmm. So, um, anyway, Joe, Joe Rogan and Alex Jones are complete astrological opposites. Alex Jones was born on February 11th and Joe Rogan was born August 11th. Yep. Six months. And you know, what's been happening astrologically are the, the, the moon's nodes have been in Leo and Aquarius respectively. So the true node, which is the ascending plane of the moon, and these change every roughly 17 months has been in Leo which is like, and it's like, it's like the head, right? It's called the dragon's head. It's a dragon's head for a reason. It's breathing fire. It's eating, you know, maidens, you know I mean? It's like, it's vital. Mm-hmm. So the true node is the dragon's head. The south node is the dragon's tail. And it is certainly less vital. It's like, you know, the, the dragon's tail is evacuating. And the dragon's head is taking an influence and taking on influence. So if you look at the sign of Aquarius, um, the dragon's tail has been in Aquarius, which is Alex Jones' sign, which has made Alex Jones uh, a bit more vulnerable Mm -hmm. because of the south node of the dragon's tail. Meanwhile, the dragon's head has been approaching Rogan's son. Now, Rogan is a... uh, Is it eight... 18 degree sun. So the true node would have been on his sun right around the beginning of the year, mm-hmm. which meant that the south node would have been on Jones's sun right around the beginning. Of the year. And I don't know if you were, you might remember this, but I, I believe if I'm not mistaken, um, Alex Jones had that meltdown around Trump. And I think the South Node is right around his son. And that was a major time where he was going to lo- where he was losing influence and power. And meanwhile, Joe Rogan's son is rising. So there's this weird thing about the universe that like has this mechanism of balance. It's really fascinating. Yeah. So well, we have Joe, Joe Rogan has been, I mean, it's interesting. I'd say that Joe Rogan's popularity is hitting like absolute fever pitch right now. It has been for the last couple. I mean, he's well, been right. for a long time. But yes. right now, I mean, when you have a day, in one day he had a, a podcast with Chuck Palahniuk and Neil deGrasse Tyson, right? Like that is just whatever you think of either of those people. I happen to like Chuck Palahniuk and not so much Neil deGrasse Tyson, right? But, you know, you're talking to those people in the same day. The amount of people that are going to be interested in listening to what you have to say that day is so great. Meanwhile, Alex is diddling around over on Mike Adams network now because he can't be on YouTube. Right. That's that's right. And And he's he's lucky. And and, and Rogan said he can't have him on the show. now. can't have him on the show because he doesn't want to get sued or whatever. Right. Is that what he said? Yeah. Which is another part of a crossover with Joe Rogan. Yeah. Yeah. So just, as we speak, the true node currently is at five degrees. It's right on Joe Rogan's Mercury. So this is going to, Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan has um, three planets in Leo. 
I mean, it's got Sun. Go ahead. Sorry. Sun, Jupiter, Mercury, all Neo. He's a big personality. Anytime you get a Sun Jupiter conjunction, especially in Leo, it's huge personality. I mean, I would go so far as to say that right now he is probably the most influential person in information. Right? You know, like because, like you know, maybe you know, yeah, because. The conspiracy people listen to him. The non-conspiracy people listen to him. The right listens to him. The left listens to him. He's just crossed. He's just mainstream enough that, that they don't they don't reject him. He's just underground enough. They they have found the sweet spot with him. You know what I mean? They really really have. And I'd say, um, ed, anybody who's interested in information at this point is aware of and listen or listening to Joe Rogan, and. It's so fascinating to me how a guy that we got to know by him getting people to eat bugs and talk about fighting and stuff like that is now the king of information. Yeah, no, I, I, would, I would totally, totally agree with that. Um, yes, absolutely. Now, there are some redeeming aspects to him. Sure. I told you, yeah, I like him. Uh, and by the way, I've got him as an Aries rising at 23 degrees, which I'll, which I'll share why. Um, the redeeming aspects is that, you know, I was watching his interview based on your recommendation with uh, Shooter Jennings. Oh, what a mess, yep. And one of the things that he said, which I firmly believe in, is that, you know, if you go out at night, you go to a bar, and you're like hanging out at a bar, and you're meeting people, and you're doing shots, don't you want that to be like a really great experience? Don't you want to be like the next day think of, hey, you know, I, I ran into a whole group of strangers. We did shots all night. We're high-fiving. We're hitting the jukebox. It was an amazing time. Right. Versus being the guy that gets into a pissy match in a fight. Right. And He's a happy was, guy. He's a happy guy. There's no question about it. Yeah, and I, and I would say that they're, that they're yeah. you know, that, and he's, he's got the right intent, mm -hmm. right? He has the right intent. And I was on uh, this website called um, Return of Kings. Have you, have you, you know that site? Mm -mm. It's, it's, a, it, it's a, like a hardcore, like, dude site. Okay. And it's kind of in men, go, in the men going their own way sort of kind of vein. And they love Joe Rogan. Mm-hmm. Because they, they think of Joe Rogan as this symbol of, of masculine power. Right. Male power. And to some extent, they're kind of right. You know, he's an MMA guy. Um, you know, he's got tats. So he's got, yeah. he's got, he's got you know, bona fides. He's, he's, he eats mostly meat. He's, you know I mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's, he's got all that going for him. Let me get into his chart a little bit. All right. Yeah, please. Okay. So one of the things that's interesting about him and his upbringing is that his father was a cop. And his father left when he was five years old. He's never seen his father since. So this is an interesting... Oh, that's interesting. That just makes it more interesting. Yeah, this is an interesting factoid around authority in father figures. And he has Saturn... In Aries. So Saturn is the father in the chart. Right. Aries represents military, police, football players, boxers, <coughs> masculinity. So, so, so wow, this is this is interesting. So what I did is I I put that Saturn in the twelfth house because that's the mystery of the father in the twelfth house. And he, so Rogan, throughout the course of his life, even though if you ask him, hey, are you, are you looking for your dad? Um, he would probably say no. But I would say that that answer wouldn't be fully true. Mm -hmm. That he's looking at a very deep level for some kind of authority to step forward ah. in his life, which we'll talk about. Huh. A little bit. Interesting. Um, he's also really big into float tanks, right? Yeah. I, I, I was going to bring that up. Yeah. Later. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. He's into float so tanks. So I had to kind of, yeah. I had to kind of take that into stuff. account. Yeah. And, and I made part of his 12th house, Pisces, 
mm -hmm. which would be kind of that float tank thing. And he has Chiron at 29 Pisces, which is a really interesting degree for Chiron because it's the final degree of the Zodiac. And after that, you, you start anew, right? The whole thing clicks to zero. And it, that's in his 12th house, which is Pisces house natally. Here it's split by Aries and Pisces. So he's got Saturn, the, the father, the missing father in the 12th house. And he's got Chiron at 29. And, and the, the whole float tank thing for him, I believe, is a way for him to get closer to, to God. That's what I think. Whatever version Joe Rogan has of that. It's right there in his chart. So I'm thinking, okay, well, we've got some elements to work with. Let's put the chart at around 23 degrees Aries rising. Puts Black Moon Lilith there, the dark woman, uh, dark, shadowy emotions, perhaps. Mm -hmm. you know, shadow, shadowy intent. Like that's the identity. Yeah. You know, it's the shadowy moon. Mm -hmm. There's something a little dark about Joe Rogan too. Yeah. And the true note is that zero... Taurus in the first house. Now, he, this is kind he, of he doesn't. He tries to not let people see it. He tries to pretend he's just this happy-go-lucky guy and whatever. But you, if oh, you no, pay, no, he emits darkness. If you if you pay close attention, there is there it, it seeps out. There is a darkness to him. For it, sure. it's, it's not the same kind of darkness as a is Argento darkness. It's no. not. It's not even close. He's not a vampire. No, he's not. But there's something. I tell you right now, there's something that's haunting Joe Rogan. Well, I think if you listen to him tell his stories about uh, his DMT trips and he repetitively tells one has some sort of like dark sort of gestures or some sort of, you know, whatever, like I, that, that exists within him. That is part of who he is, is a little bit of a dark gesture. You know, yeah. He's a, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the whole MMA thing is Aries. And it's like, let's put that front and center on the first house. You know, let's put it front and center. And by the way, if you look at Saturn, it would have taken Saturn uh, five years from the time he was born to transit his first house all the way through and get into his second house. And that would have been the time when his father would have left, when Saturn hit the second house. And that's like a physical reality and becoming aware of Gemini and being split. So in some ways, his father leaving split him. Again, this is based on what I'm dealing with with this chart. Okay. And whether or not Saturn is coming out of his 12th house, going through his first house, growing up rather quickly, and then hitting his second house in Gemini, doesn't really matter. Because it's going to take roughly five years, almost five years, from Saturn to go from Aries to Gemini. So whatever house it's going to be going through, that Saturn transit is going to split Joe Rogan right around the age of five. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he has the true node in Taurus in the first house. That's all about self. By the way, Aries rising people tend to lose their hair early. Right. So what do we have? We have a bald headed guy. Yeah. Martial arts guy, Aries. Right. Um, and then his, his Leo planets are in the fifth house. So they're in, they're in Leo's house, which means that that energy is um, amplified because the sun is in the fifth house and that's, it's in Leo, it's conjunct Jupiter. It's big, 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 big energy. But here's where we get into sort of the astrological forensics of Joe Rogan's chart. First of all, um, if I was his astrologer, I would say that he should not do drugs. Mm. That the flow tank is cool. Like you can see that with Chiron in the 12th. It's like, you know, yeah, go flow tank. But he has his south node in, in Scorpio. Mm -hmm. And w one of the things that is sort of like common knowledge when you deal with the south node, it's like true node, this life, south node, past life. Like Joe Rogan has been um, a shaman, uh, a curandero, a, bru a brujo, yeah. a sorcerer, a warlock. He's got these past life experiences. They're in his chart. He's not supposed to do them in this lifetime. 
Interesting. And that's, I mean, so, you know, when you think of Joe Rogan, like one of the things that's, well, there's a lot of things that's inter- interesting about Joe Rogan, but he has really been um, the modern day, like version of, in some ways, like a Timothy Leary or a Terrence McKenna in terms of pushing these ideas of uh, DMT and, you know, very pro marijuana and the float tanks and all of these, these are all psychedelic experiences. And, um, you know, he, I mean, he repetitively tells the same stories over and over and over about DMT, right? I mean, he also has pushed a lot of, I mean, he's very into like the ketogenic diet and the MMA and the, you know, intermittent fasting. He has brought all of the, he has made it almost yeah, like a stuff is in his, By the way, that stuff is in his sixth house. Right, like it's, he's made cults. Fasting. He's made cults around all of it. Yeah, that's all sixth house because his sixth house winds up being Virgo. Mm-hmm. And he has Uranus and Pluto and Venus, all the sixth house, health, healing, Virgo, the fasting, ketogenic diet, you know, clean, pure, Virgoian, you know, not a lot of carbs, kind of food, diet. And then all that material is in sextile with his Scorpio material. I mean, he's made, he's made like, you know, so you have the DMT stuff, the float tank stuff. He's talked a lot about mushrooms, a lot about weed. He does drugs in the float tanks, sure. right? He's popular. Absolutely. I mean, there would be, you know, there, there's an enormous float tank industry right now because part, largely because of Joe Rogan, right? That's yeah. the first place I heard about it, right? You, you know, yeah. I've had the, ref, the recollection, you know, in following years that, that that wasn't really the first place I heard about it. But at, at the time, yes. And, um, you know, he also has brought forward all of these, like, nootropic supplements with his on it company right so he has like you know he's used to sell kettlebells and and exercise ropes and stuff like that and all these i mean there is really a cult of men and even women who listen to his show that do all this stuff just like there was a cult around timothy leary and ken kesey and terrence mckenna and all these kinds of people he is the sort of modern day internet version of that, but he's not just doing it with the drugs, he's doing it with all these areas of lifestyle. This is a complete control of all the aspects of someone's life if they're in the sort of Joe Rogan experience cult. Right, I read an interview uh, from around 2012 and this guy asks him, you know, what, what advice do you have for young men? And he, and he said, uh, get right with your biology. And what he was basically saying was, Look, you got to eat the right food. You got to understand your body. You got to work out. You know, that's fundamental. You can't do anything in your I can't life. Can't argue with that. And I agree with that. Yeah, I yeah totally, me too. And this is the stuff. See, this is where Joe Rogan, I think, is really strong. I, I my favorite stuff to listen to him about is about some. I love when he has certain health people on, or you know, when he talks about some of this kind of. That's my favorite stuff. I much prefer than when he Absolutely. tries to. Get, yeah. That's that's his that's his where he's in his wheelhouse. Yeah. The sixth house, Venus, Pluto, Uranus, in Virgo, sixth house, and all those planets are sextiling. He's got a bunch of planets in Scorpio. He's got Moon in Scorpio, Mars in Scorpio, Neptune in Scorpio, and Joe Rogan is into power. He is into power in a big way, mm-hmm. really big way. And he's got a Sun Mars square, you know, which makes him a fighter. I mean, there's no, I'm not this and this. I got a Sun Mars square in my chart. People with some R squares generally tend to have a lot of anger, and usually around the father. Well, have, some, you, have uh, you ever seen the vein in his forehead that pops out when he's like getting mad at somebody because he can't convince them that they're wrong about everything? Yeah, he yeah. looks like he's about to burst. You can tell he has a temper. You, you know, what, well, like, yeah. well, he's Irish and Italian. Yeah. So that's, you know, it's part of his uh, genetics. Yeah. Uh, but here's where I think things get very interesting. He's got a Sun Neptune square. This is usually an aspect of somebody who will sell themselves out. Mm-hmm. Because the identity be- has the potential to become corrupt. Like when you have a Sun Neptune square, whether it's through the use of drugs, whether it's through sex, adulation, um, there can be kind of a, a, a rent in mm-hmm. the identity. And there can be kind of a, not kind of, there can be a very 
disingenuous mm -hmm. at times um, exposition of that identity. And the way Sun Neptune squares work, the individual may not even really be aware of it. Yeah. He may not even be really aware of the fact that he's being either disingenuous or somehow being corrupted. Mm -hmm. And Jupiter was also in square with Neptune, which means that it amplifies. Like, this guy is into power. Like, if, if I didn't know this was Joe Rogan, I would still say that this person's really in the power. Yeah. I mean, Mars, Mars and Scorpio is no bullshit, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a very powerful aspect of Mars. And you put that to the moon, you bolt that to the moon, well, and the moon is desire. There's a, this, he can channel very, in, very intense desire. Yeah, and yeah. and he's of, powerful in every way. I remember watching a video clip of someone who's one of the best MMA fighters, period, and them saying that Joe Rogan has – the most powerful, I can't remember if it was a roundhouse kick or some kind of kick that they have ever seen. And there was a video clip of him doing it, right? And so yes. this is a guy who's able to generate and create from his own self a lot of power, and he really likes that. So here's what, here, okay, this is interesting for the seventh house. Because he's got that south node there in Scorpio. He's got the moon in Scorpio. Uh, he's got the moon is squaring Mercury. Uh, the moon is squaring Jupiter. I, you know, sometimes he's, it's not that he's a liar. He, you know, he doesn't have any squares to, to Neptune with, with Mercury. So he's not really a liar. But there's something about his identity with that Mars, the Sun-Neptune square that does not, it's not, it's not kosher in some ways. Mm -hmm. And we may find out over the course of the next few weeks, there may be something that might come out of his past. Mm. Or, or a relationship or a partnership gone bad. It might even happen on a show because you know, he's in that one-on-one -on -one format on his show. Mm -hmm. And that's the seventh house. It's one-on-one. -on -one. Mars and, and Mars shows up there. So he's aggressive one-on-one. -on -one. And you told me about this exchange with Candace Owens where he kept trying to like crank her on climate change, right? Yeah. And she wouldn't do it, right? He did great. I mean, I, I, you know, she did great. And it was, I just couldn't believe how upset he was. He, he could not stand that he could not get her to fold. Like he had kind of met his match in her, right? Really yeah. young girl. And she was just like, look, I don't know everything about it, but like, I'm inclined to think it's bullshit. Right. And, and, and the part I just can't get my head around is why he cares so much. <laughs> right. Like it was, he couldn't believe that he couldn't browbeat her into saying, you know what? You're right. I'm going to go look into it and stop talking about it. Yeah. He couldn't get her to do it. He couldn't browbeat her. And, um, he, and then for the next, for a couple of days later, Danny found this, because Danny and I talked a little bit about this on a program, you know, Danny Katz. She found a, a meme where he was like making fun of Candace Owens. He was still pissed off about it three, four, five days later. So he was putting out memes about it. Right. Right. Which now works. that's, that's not the, the persona that he displays, like he, he, he wants people to think that he's so bent out of shape about something that he has to make memes about it three or four or five days later, right? Yeah. That's something he would accuse Alex, jo Alex Jones of doing. Yeah. yeah. Right? So she got his knickers in a fucking twist, dude. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can see this in the chart. He wants to dominate mm -hmm. with Mars in the seventh house. That's his thing. Yeah. Scorpio. Um, he, he, he needs to be careful with, with the drug thing, though. Because of that South Node in Scorpio. I think, he's, I think he's already bumped up against this. Like, he's talked about going long periods of time without doing it because he's had some scary trips. Yeah. Um, you know, he ultimately always goes back. And he's, he, every year he takes a, a month off of weed. And he has some revelations. He always goes back. Um, but, yeah, I agree, I agree with you. Like, I, 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 that it's probably – and every time he does it, he's taking more and more – uh, risk of, of, you know, coming across something that he might not be able to recover from. Um, one of the things that I look for in rectifying a chart are events mm -hmm. that kind of correspond to the chart. So one of the main falling outs that he had was with Jan Irvin. Yeah. And this is not uncommon. That was the turning point in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is not uncommon at a, at a kind of a, like his falling out with Jan Irvin was almost operatic. 
Mm -hmm. But he'll do similar things like what he did with Steven Tyler. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have the same kind of cachet with Steven Tyler because he and Jan Irvin were like You're psychonauts friends. and talked about the same stuff. And friends. The, same thing. Uh, the, 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 the show, the, like in one of the best Joe Rogan shows ever that really turned me on to him and got me into watching it was the first time Jan Irvin was on. I was like, damn, this is some good shit. Like, I could, like, that was one of those shows you just wanted to go on forever and ever and ever and ever, you know? Yeah. And Jan was talking about, you know, the historical aspects of psychedelics and mushrooms and all this stuff. And they were having such an awesome conversation. And you're like, well, damn, this guy, Jan's really smart. And then, you know, like, went and looked into him and found out about all his research on the trivium and the quadrivium and how smart he is. And, and Joe Rogan seemed to be enamored of how intelligent he was. And then, you know, Jan made the mistake or, or maybe not the mistake, it was probably good, he, it was great he did it, of, you know, challenging one of Joe Rogan's sacred cows. And that, you know, that was, in my opinion, like the turning point. You it was know? the Bigfoot stuff, right? Well, I don't know if it was the Bigfoot or if it was the Terrence McKenna stuff. I think it was Terrence McKenna and some of the Bigfoot stuff. I didn't know, I wasn't aware of the Bigfoot. I knew about the Terrence McKenna stuff. Uh, the guy, he, so Joe Rogan was into this guy named Powell. Mm-hmm. And he, he's like been on, on the quest, but I think McKenna was part, but also the Bigfoot stuff. I, we, I've never heard Jan talk about Bigfoot. I must've missed. No, but no, it's not Jan, Joe Rogan. Oh. oh, okay. I mean, I think Rogan was like romanticizing Bigfoot as this like mushroom chomping. Yes. Kind of, you know, no, well, you, you, you either have people are either like for the most part, like people have their archetypes. They're either into aliens or ghosts or Bigfoot or whatever. And Joe Rogan's a Bigfoot guy. He's, yeah, it fits him. Yeah. Primal. Bigfoot's primal, but, you know, maybe super intelligent and multidimensional. Just like Joe Rogan. Yeah. Yeah, an, an ape from space. Right. right. And I even think, like, Joe Rogan, didn't he have, like, a like a comedy thing called Apes in Space? or? Yeah, and he had T-shirts with, like, he had, like, uh, he used to make a, like, a noise like a Bigfoot in the beginning, like an ape in the beginning of his. Yeah, that, uh, that's, his, that's his thing. Yeah, he likes that. Yeah, so, so. But what's interesting is that when the whole thing with Jan Irvin, which I think happened around 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, that's when Saturn was in Scorpio. And that's when, again, based on this chart, because I had to play around with this, right? It's like, oh, well, that happened in 2013. And Saturn would have been going through his seventh house of partnership uh, in 2013. And that's when... It was going over his south node and his moon and his Mars. And I, again, this gets back to this whole thing with like, um, you know, Anthony Bourdain uh, stabbing the, his cinematographer in the back. Right. And the sacrifice. This is what Joe and I, this is what Robert and I were talking about. Did we talk about it on the show or before? I think we talked about it before. Did we talk about it on the show? I can't remember. Yeah, we're talking about it. Okay, I couldn't remember. We, 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 no, Robert and I were having a conversation long. before we started. The first started. part of the show was like two years ago already. Right. <laughs> so it's a similar thing because he and Jan Irvin were really tight. And, and I watched that show. And I'm like, Joe Rogan is, is, is basically, you know, putting a knife in this guy's back. And he's doing it knowingly. Yeah. I watched it. And Jan Irvin was shocked. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it, 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 it's kind of like, you know, hanging out with your good friends and you guys are, you know, you know, smoking some buds and doing a few shots and you just have a great time. And all of a sudden your buddy, you know, just balls up his fists and hits you in the chin really hard. Yeah. And you're like, you don't see it coming. And you're like, what? I watched Jan Irvin with this. And he was not, I mean, I'll have he had, to go back and watch this. I, I don't even know if I've seen this. Like I saw the first time Jan was on and then I knew from other shows that Jan and Joe had had a falling out. I didn't know it actually happened on the air. I'm going to have to go back. Oh, and you can that. watch it. It's, yeah. it's, you know, and it's kind of, and, and Rogan is almost like taking delight in it. So what, you know, when, when I saw that, and you, you and I began to talk about this whole thing, yeah. like, to me, that was, that was the that equivalent was the of the sacrifice. Yeah. He sacrificed his friend. Yeah. His, and, and somebody who he was traveling on this 
kind of elevated psychedelic truth path, right? Well, and also, I would say that marked the end of him having intelligent, conspiracy-minded people on and moved, he moved into this having idiotic people who are easy to make fun of and debunk and make look silly. And that, you know, we're going to take a break here in just a second. And when we come back in the second, in the, in the patrons hour, uh, which event may actually, if we decide this is important, go up publicly eventually. But, um, you know, we're going to get into this sort of evolution that he's had where he's gone from um, being a conspiracy theorist to not being one and being a not trusting of government to being wholly trusting of government, except for like in certain financial senses. It's very weird, but it all seemed to start with that Jan Irvin situation. And Jan, totally ever agree. since then, he has not had an intelligent conspiracy minded person on his program at yep. all. Yep. Yeah. All right. So anything else you want to say about his chart or sort of the more pu open public side? Uh, of this? I would say, I would say that uh, we can see his popularity on, on the internet with the Joe Rogan experience with the uh, part of fortune at three degrees Aquarius, um, just ingressing into the 11th house, 11th house being social media, social, social networks, so yeah, I mean it's there in his chart. Um, he's gonna have a peak here. It, it, like he's gonna be very. I mean again, based on this chart, he's gonna have a peak here. But simultaneously, like he's gonna be really, really strong for the next year and a half. Nine months, year, year and a half. Yeah, I see it too. Year and a half, and then something's gonna happen. Something's gonna happen. In my sense is, is that something is going to revolve around his father. Mm. And his father is going to make a more public kind of, more personal, perhaps public connection with Joe Rogan. Interesting. And that's going to change his world. Mm. It'll change his world. Also, I believe that he's going to have another rubicon across mm -hmm. and um, maybe we could talk about that in the second part of the show all right so we're going to take a break hang with us this is off planet radio i'm emily moyer i'm with robert phoenix we'll see you on the patron side in just a minute we'll be right back all right and we are back. We are now in the Patrons Hour. Thank you very much to all the patrons out there who are supporting Heidi and I and making all this happen. We love you. We appreciate you. We know it's going to be funky to this summer. We're getting back on the uh, get back on track. And thank you for sticking with us. And pop it to the Hey, I love, you know, I love your Patreons, your non-Patreons, uh, to really, you know, collect a really smart, turn on, so uh, I can't do it in show. Yeah. All right, so I didn't, I, we, we forgot to tell people where you can find you at the end of the first hour, but people pretty much know it. I'll include it in the link, but for the patrons here, where can they find you, Robert? All right, patrons, it's time for the inside baseball. No, I was going to say, where just before we get going, remind people where they can find you if the patrons want to go over and check out. Oh, robertphoenix.com. Guys, get a reading. Like, a lot of my friends have gotten readings from him this summer, and they really like them. I've had tons of readings. I'm going to get that everything reading one of these days when I have three hours to spare or whatever, however long it takes. <laughs> it's a two-hour two extravaganza. Two-hour extravaganza. Yeah. But, um, yeah, guys, do yourself a favor. That's totally interesting and enjoyable. And he, he hits things from my first reading from you back four years ago now. About this time four years ago, still have continued to play out. So it's very interesting. All right, yeah. so let's get into the inside baseball about Mr. Rogan. Where were we? So we're t I was talking about uh, the South Node going up on to his tent in his 10th house, uh, mm -hmm. transit after. Well, that's interesting. His friend Eddie Bravo has 10th, house, 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu, right? 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu. Eddie Bravo, this brings up an interesting point, is a Taurus. And um, that would put Eddie Bravo's son 
in Joe Rogan's first house, which would mean he would be an influential person uh -huh. in Rogan's life, right? Like he would, yep. he would impart something to him, mm -hmm. which he has. He's given totally. it. A lot of jujitsu, you know, stuff, right? Yeah. So um, Joe Rogan's going to have kind of a bit of a challenge, I believe, like many of us will in 2020 when we get into that Saturn-Pluto conjunction. Um, so he's going to have another kind of Rubicon to cross. But one of, the, one of the things that I've been thinking about is this whole idea of like a the death of conspiracy and that and that conspiracy as a social movement or truth as a social movement um in as much as i believe there's a lot of kind of very real threads going through it like if you were to go back to the 60s and listen to talks by like alan watts or uh krishna marie you know, some of these luminaries who were really important during the 60s, you would say to yourself, you know, we're drinking the same thing. Do you know that? I drink it all the time. I love it. Yes. Isn't that wild? <laughs> like, I'll tell you what, this is, I decided to get this the other day. It's so, it's the best, other than Topo Chico, it's the best bubbly water. Topo I Chico agree. So you and I are right now are having like quantum entanglement. Yeah, totally. Like, why did I grab this? <laughs> At H E B yesterday, and I I don't always buy this. It's just the best. It's stuff is good, guys. I drink the sparkling water, and I also have the distilled water delivered to my house. I get a case of this, and I get two, two five gallons of distilled water every. Right, month. We didn't plan this at all. Right? We didn't, but it doesn't surprise me. And so I guess we're drinking the same Kool Aid, so it explains a lot of stuff. Same, yeah. Okay, so you go back in the '60s, and like there were some really interesting things that happened in the '60s. To say that it was just some. MK Ultra Theater, I think would be totally disingenuous. Sure. But it was also there too. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, there was this big production going on. If it was only an MK Ultra Theater, it wouldn't be interesting. It wouldn't work. MK Ultra Theater only works on top of something that's fascinating anyway. Right. And so, but there was a time where it's like, okay, show's over. Yeah. You know, let's bring uh, the street drugs onto the scene. Mm -hmm. Methamphetamine, speed, heroin. You know, all the dark stuff. Mm -hmm. and, when that's, and that began to infiltrate. And I mean, it's clear as day in, in um, San Francisco, Hate Asbury, the summer of love ended when all the hard drugs hit the streets. Mm -hmm. It was over. And that stuff was planned too, right? It's like, okay, you know, show's over. Mm -hmm. I think to some extent that this um, period that we're in, where we've been kind of waking up and the red pill and, you know, I think part of it is staged. Totally. Yeah, I think part of it is staged. I, the, 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 I mean, there's, there's something called truth or programming. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Alex Jones is part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know people are going to hate me for this. Bill I think Cooper QAnon is part of, part of it. What's that? What, who's part of it? QAnon. I think QAnon's a part totally. of it. Totally. I think Bill and, Cooper was part of it. That doesn't mean that people can't wake up and aren't waking up. and You know, that's fine. Yeah. Right. Great. It's like, you know, I cheer them on, but we're coming to the end of like the, just like the sixties ended, you know, the, the end of conspiracy is coming. Yep. And, um, Joe Rogan is there is the bridge to usher in this new thing. Yep. And, and I believe he's been chosen for that. Mm -hmm. So, because he's now down, you know, down, you know, downvoting all the conspiracy stuff. Everything. Everything. The only conspiracies he doesn't downvote anymore are ones that involve like drugs, marijuana, and like you know, he'll, he's totally into the Ricky Ross thing and all that. Kind he of loves stuff. Ricky Ross. Right, and who, what's not to love? R R Ricky Ross is really interesting and whatever. So the o the only conspiracies that I really see Joe Rogan acknowledging anymore, and they're like, he, and he loves these ones are. You know, the ones about drugs and then the ones he'll talk over and over and over again about Alex Jones's film, about what went down at the, um, that, uh, the um, tra World Trade Organization um, uh, protest when they, you know, he, the government people were there with their government issued boots and they were pretending to be protesters and whatever. The WTO, the battle in Seattle. Or when, yeah, so he'll, he'll talk about that. He'll talk about the freeway Ricky Ross and the CIA and the Sandinistas and all that kind of stuff. And 
you know, but everything else, I mean, he's really backpedaled on his thoughts about the moon. He's backpedaled on uh, 9-11. He doesn't want to hear, he, he will have nothing. He, he doesn't want to talk about chemtrails, thinks that's ridiculous. And he's kind of always thought chemtrails are ridiculous. So I, I feel like that's something that's always been part of his programming. Um, but does, you know, totally what uh, 180 is on the Bigfoot and stuff like that seems really interested in aliens, but always like he was there to sort of debunk that too. Um, he, uh, let's see, does not want to hear anything about any of these, you know, fake events or anything like that. You know what I mean? Like other than to make fun of the people who say that, but he never has with all of these things, he never has a really good researcher on to talk about them. He, right? he, he brings on the biggest dunce in the world to deb to, and then uses that opportunity to debunk it and make everybody look silly and, right. and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, he used to be, you know, remember when he was on Rosie O'Donnell's show and said, what happened to Building 7? He used to be a 9-11 truther. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Now yeah. he's like, no. Yeah. No, he's no, he, no, he won't go there. Well, so there's a reason for that because uh, they are now getting ready to um, kind of end the, you know, the conspiracy, the age of the conspiracy theory mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. You know, they they want to go through this kind of collective debunking now. Mm -hmm. in mock yeah you know, it's like it's reached this kind of fever pitch well, and joe joe rogan is the mocker and king right joe, oh, yeah. joe rogan first so i first like i can't remember what happened first but obviously he was on what was that growth show he was on um where they ate bugs and did dares and stuff yeah it was called we talking about, it's escaping my mind at, i can't think of it but so I, I can't remember if that was the first place i saw him or i, I my my friend rj used to sing some song that was from South Park that was singing about Joe Rogan. So we all know that when they're talking, and this was like back in like 2001 or something, right? So if they were already talking about Joe Rogan on South Park in 2001, then we know because they put all this shit in South Park and, and the Simpsons and all that kind of stuff that he was going to be a more major figure. And the first way we got to know him was by- Fear factor. Well, fear, fear factor. factor getting people to do things that are gross and dehumanizing and sacrificial and all that kind of shit. It's almost like Illuminati rituals, right? Totally. Yeah. Like being dropped into ice cold water, you know, it was the precursor of shit like the ice bucket challenge. Oh yeah. But it, yeah. I mean, they actually kind of mirrored Illuminati rituals being, being buried in, um, a clear polyurethane casket with thousands of cockroaches from South America. Right. Stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, he, he, he reveled in it. He loved it. He was very into it. Yeah. Uh, that's where he came. The other thing. That's, too, that's, that's about mocking humans. That's about getting humans to do something. Oh, it's debasing de them. Degrading and debasing for money. Yeah. It's yeah. debasing them. Yeah. It's almost like the cremation of care in some way. Totally. Which that's another thing. He will acknowledge the fact that that's real and Alex Jones snuck in there and took video of that and whatever. So, you know, yeah. He, that, but it is like that. So his role now is to usher conspiracy out. Mm -hmm. to that's make it, his role. To make it seem silly and passe. That's right. Which means also that if you take this perspective, you'll be smarter than these stupid conspiracy people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Forget conspiracy. Yeah. Instead, join the intellectual dark web where we yeah. question things, but only to a point. And we do it in suits and we do it in, you know, fancy theaters and whatnot. And, and these are, and, you know, and there's no criticism of Israel. <laughs> but you can't go there. Right. Um, well, but, you know, so, yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you about all of that. And then I also think there's a darker, deeper layer. But as far as what you're saying, if he wants to, you know, if he's really as interesting and as smart and, and this is really as cutting edge of a show as it's, you know, it's supposed to be, have a really bright conspiracy researcher on, right? Have on Melissa Dykes from Truthstream Media. Have on, if you're going to talk about you know, have on a James Corbett or something like that. Somebody who isn't silly, right? Somebody you can oh, have. I, I'd love to see him have E. Michael Jones on. E. Michael Jones would eat him for lunch. You know, have. Uh, to pull any of his bullying. E. Michael Jones. Um, who is, who's E. Michael Jones? 
he, he's a researcher. He wrote Baron Metal, and um, he wrote a really amazing book about, I, I forget the name of it now, but it's, it's about um, ur urban renewal um, as um, a, a kind of this um, urban renewal as racial warfare. Mm. I mean, it's really like, huh. he, he, Michael Jones, he's a big time Catholic. Mm -hmm. He's really, really, really steeped in Catholicism. Yeah. And just, there's a there's that part of him I don't I, I don't really like adhere to in a lot of ways, um, but he has this kind of moral courage and conviction that comes out of that, and he's he's brilliant. He's absolutely he's brilliant. And if he had, or even a guy like Michael Hoffman, uh, and um, you know Michael Hoffman's the guy that talks about the revolution method. Michael Hoffman's a genius. So if Rogan had either of those guys on, I mean. But I mean, if, even if, if you want to talk about some of these, you know, more current conspiracies and all the things, he, he never has somebody who's intelligent on, who's done a lot of research, who's written a really good book about it, he, you know, with conspiracy stuff. Then with the alien stuff, he has people like Tom DeLonge and Stephen Greer and Steven Tyler on there to talk about it. If he, why not, you know, whatever you think of him, if you want to talk about the shit that's going, forget the aliens. If he wants to have someone on there to talk about the shit that's going on in the sky, why not have Joseph Farrell or Catherine Austin Fitz or someone like that who can speak about something intelligent that's going on with the finances and the, you know, the stuff around it or whatever, yeah, right? He won't though. He, he well, won't go there. He only has people on to talk about. You know, he'll he'll mock chemtrails, but he's never had somebody who is a serious, you know, researcher, you know, on there to talk about that kind of stuff. Um, he just laughs at it and makes fun of it with people who don't really know anything about it. You know, right. and, um, you know, so if he really is, you know, why not have somebody intelligent on to talk about it? When he wants to have someone on to talk about something that he thinks is a serious issue, he gets somebody say, you know, I, one, of the, one, of the, one of the great shows he did recently, like, well, maybe it was like in the last year, was with Paul Stamets, who's like a famous mycologist, right, to talk about mushrooms and different kinds of stuff. It was a fascinating show. Get somebody who is that level intellectual, who is more conspiratorial minded to come on and speak to some of this. And, and ha if you want to go ahead and disagree, go ahead and disagree. But why can't there just be an agreement to talk about something and disagree? Why does it have to be this brow beating? You know, so, so there's that level of it. Well, that's the, you know, but that's where his power trip comes in. Yeah. You know, this guy's into power. I mean, one of the things that he has no air in his chart, none. So he can't like get up above. You know, Alex Jones was his, it was like the helium to his balloon in some ways. And, um, but he has no air in his chart, so he can't get a, a large, larger perspective. He's too rooted in earth and fire and water, right? Those are his main elements and primarily fire. He's got a lot of fire in his chart. So I thought about this idea of power and how somebody like Joe Rogan could make a decision to, you know, kind of go back on the res, so to speak, right? Right. And, and, I, and I thought in a lot of ways, like, it's simply like also in as much as we're going to get in maybe some of this other CIA stuff. Yeah. It's also like a personal choice where, he could like the experience the conspiracy stuff has a limited shelf life mm -hmm. and it's getting even more limited now mm -hmm. and he probably even knows that on a number of different levels and so what he's doing is he's like removing himself and he's giving himself more longevity he's becoming more mainstream yeah that's what he's aiming for and that's power and it's money yeah and sometimes the, the most basic and fundamental sorts of reasons are the ones that people motivate people to do certain things versus, um, you know, somebody threatening his family or, you know, some of those things. I mean, I think he's more into power than he's into money. I think he is more motivated by the power than the money. Uh, power. It, yeah, power. It, but there's the money piece is, is kind of big too, because it allows him to buy fancy flow tanks and shit that, you know, other other people may not. But he also makes a, a significant amount of money from the MMA stuff and 
Yeah, I, 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 I think, I think with, I think this is more power than money. I'm not saying that money's not a factor at all. But yeah, I think it's more power than it is money. He's a short guy. Yeah. He's a short guy. Five eight. Yeah. At least that's what Wikipedia says. It's probably so, five six. And yeah, eight. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that that's ultimately what's. But he's okay. He's a father. He's got a couple kids. He's married. Yep. And lives here in the valley. People who. People who are not like in a weird Hollywood place, once they get married and have kids, the majority of people tend to make really conservative choices. And I think part of what he's going through is his part of his evolution, mm -hmm. but also dovetailing with another layer so that they're kind of sinking to you, right? It would be much more difficult if he couldn't sign off on it on some level, what, what he's doing, because, because it makes sense. It gives him longevity. It gives him power. Um, he's not mopped. His kids can go to school. And instead of saying, hey, your dad's a fucking conspiracy freak, it would be, hey, your dad is actually really cool. Your dad is right? so I mean, cool. He talks to everybody. Right. You know, it's, it's kind, it's like kind of like the modern day Charlie Rose. Kind of. Yeah. I, I think that's a pretty, pretty apt. Like, it's like the hipper, cooler, more fit, you know, internet age Charlie Rose. Yeah, I was trying to think of the equivalent of like what he's doing. And it's kind of like a Rand Paul becoming a Republican versus being a libertarian like his dad. Right. Or he's probably really a libertarian at heart, but he's making this choice to be more conservative in some ways. I think part of I think part of that is motivating Joe Rogan. But the other part is that he I believe that he is uh, and this is where we get into maybe if you want to shift gears with this Mike Baker guy. Yeah, I want to get into some of this stuff with, you know, this Mike Baker CIA stuff and I also want to hit on some mind control MK Ultra kind of stuff too. Okay, why don't you want let's let's see where that goes. All right. So, one of the things that like I have, you know, you know, begun to notice about this is so, so many of the things that he has talked about and has focused on and have been part of his show and his evolution, the float tanks, the DMT, the mushrooms, the exercise, the training, the MMA fighting, the ketogenic diet. <laughs> this is all part of the training. This is all stuff, you know, these are all things that were, um, maybe not so much the ketogenic diet, right? Because that is more a solution to the issue later. But like, you know, these are all things that were done to kids in the projects. Anechoic chambers, high dosing of psychedelics, you know, when it, at really young ages, you know, you know, training in physical, you know, stuff, you know, training in high level physical activity. That's right. Combat, all that kind of stuff, yep. right? Um, discussion of certain kinds of esoteric activities and exercises and stuff. He's basically bringing to the mainstream on a podcast, the same thing that was brought to me or to many other people like me in an underground base in the seventies. It's the externalization of MK ultra. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a great point. Okay. So all of the people that listen to his show take nootropics are on a ketogenic diet. Now, these things, this is the part that's really hard to get your head around, is that the things that were done to you, when you're deprogramming, in some ways, they also become the answer. That's where you find your answers. It's going back and doing them once you have an awareness of what has happened to you that is part of what helps you to uh, deprogram, remember things, or just sort of come to terms with it all, right? But that's not what's going on for the whole public here. You have all these people who watch Joe Rogan who are now into MMA, taking nootropics on a ketogenic diet, doing DMT, doing mushrooms, right? All this kind of stuff. And, you know, not, with a, not necessarily with a level of awareness about all the other stuff going on in the world because they're also getting all their information from Joe Rogan. Right. So he is the single stop dispenser for a personally administrated MKUltra mind control program. That's really interesting. That is really, really interesting. 
and that makes sense with like the end of the end of conspiracy, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like here's the yeah. new truth. Yeah, right. Yeah. That Everybody under fun. mind control and isn't it cool? Yeah, it's re it's really interesting. Like uh, I was uh, well, you and I were dis discussing putting this together. I told you that story about this guy who's he's and by the way, this guy's ex-military. And he's a, the husband of like one of my students. And I really hadn't had a whole lot of contact with him. And he just popped up on my chat one day on Facebook and he asked me what I thought of Alex Jones. Right. And I'd, I'd been to his, I had been to his page um, and I'd seen some of the stuff he put up there and was like, I didn't know really where he's coming from, but I felt like I was being like sounded out. You know, like yeah. um, sonar. And I said, um, this is interesting. Um, I said, yeah, you know, whatever, Alex Jones. And then I started to talk up Aaron and Melissa Dykes. Right. And then he get, really gets into Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. Says, oh, you know, I listen to Joe Rogan all the time. And then his wife, who is my student, sends me an entire like list of directory of, of Joe Rogan's podcasts on right. iTunes. Yeah. Well, so I, they were working sort of synonym, you know, syn synchronously. Head and tail of the dragon. To Alex get Jones, me, to Joe get Rogan. To listen to Joe Rogan. Yep. The other, so I have to just say this too. In the last week, since you and I have talked about doing this show, right? You know, I started talking about a week and a half ago, maybe when I was yeah. on the way back from, from the retreat. So we didn't, he's had on Chuck Palahniuk, who is one of my favorite authors who wrote the book Fight Club that the movie Fight Club was made about, which was, uh, I think that was my first clue to what was going on with me. When I saw that movie, I was like, oh my God, this, like this, there, somebody's making a movie about this stuff that I sort of think has maybe happened. This has to be a real thing if there's somebody else thinking about that. Yeah. And it was still many more years before I figured it out. But that was, I think, the first light bulb in my head. Then that same day, he had on Neil deGrasse Tyson debunking all, you know, trying to convince everybody that space exists, right? right? And then today, he had on a very interesting person. I have not gotten to listen to the whole thing yet, so I'm, I'm not going to go too far into it. But she, her name is Valentin, Valentin Thomas, and she's a, a French-Canadian who was a lawyer and a financier, and she left that to become a spear fisherman, right? And she's very interesting. But one of the things I have talked about repetitively on the patrons hour of this show is the training for being able to breathe underwater and staying underwater for a long time. And she got into that. And I don't think it's a mistake. I'm not saying that you know, they're, ta they're doing all this stuff because of you and I, but we're into some kind of synchronicity here where if, he, you know, is th this, I mean, she was basically talking about how humans were really designed to be able to live in and be underwater and all this kind of stuff. And that we have this mechanism that our bodies really can handle holding the breath or being able to be underwater for long periods of time without breath um, that, you know, we just think we can't. And that's a huge part of the program. Almost everybody I know who's been in programs has memories of being trained to be able to breathe underwater or to stay underwater for extended periods of time. And that is something that they would do. They would convince the public that we're not water animals. And then they would take the people that they're trying to train and highlight an ability that they already knew that they had. Right. So she's on there talking and she's beautiful, beautiful French Canadian girl. Her stories are interesting. This is one of the kinds of shows that you're like, Oh, this is why I like listening to Joe Rogan, but she's also bringing this element that we've all talked about here. You know what I mean? So it's fascinating. This is, you know, it's, I think we're going to get more and more and more of this. I, I mean, you know, like, I, or, you know, or maybe not, maybe, <laughs> maybe we're on to him too quickly. And you know what I mean? It'd be interesting to see what kind of comes after this, but you know, I, I you know, I think she's organic. I think her story is on some level is organic. If there is any, I mean, I only got to listen to a few clips. I haven't listened to the whole thing, but in this show, he says, he starts talking about the aquatic ape theory. And he says, I don't really know enough about it to speak about it intelligently, but that never stops me. So he's admitting to people right there that he doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. Right. And that would go for all this shit. He's not a researcher. He does, he gets stoned and he goes down rabbit holes, right? 
Yeah. And so, you know, and when he, you know, and so it, it, it's different than actually knowing stuff. He has things he's interested in and then he appeals to authority to find out stuff about that. And he always refers to the, like back to how, how he became, when, when questioned by people about why he doesn't believe in conspiracy anymore, he says, oh, well, I did this show called Joe Rogan Questions Everything. And what I found out was that they're all bullshit, right? That it's a bunch of, uh, what you don't find in conspiracies are black people. What you find are unfuckable white dudes, right? Well, you and I are conspiracy people and I don't think either of us are unfuckable white dudes and neither are a lot of people, but uh, is he saying he's an unfuckable white dude because he was once into it? But he basically did a TV show for a major television station where they hired the people that were gonna help him research this. This is not an independent underground investigation of any of that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So he doesn't actually know anything. He appeals to authority and he, you know, that's what he does. He appeals, he, he, he appeal, you know, he, he goes down stone, stone high rabbit holes, you know, to, and questions things and then ultimately appeals to authority on the way out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Well, that's the Saturn in the 12th house. And the, the, the connection to authority and that gets back into the father. The father. So let's get into some more of that that you wanted to kind of get. And well, we want to get into the you know, CIA and then the father, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, his father is like, you know, his father is like Darth Vader. And he doesn't know his father. I mean, he know, kind of knows who he is up to five, but after that, he doesn't know anything um, about this man, right? He doesn't know. So <clears throat> there are authority figures and people men who do not have a strong connection with their father generally look for father figures to come into their life and you know give them instruction give them guidance give them some form of validation and and I, and I think I think he's got this although based on his chart you wouldn't necessarily see it or know it because of Saturn being in the 12th house, it's hidden, it's dark, it's something that at some point I'll have to come to terms with. Um, like where's this Saturn? Just let me check real quick here. There's something interesting. Like, Yeah, so he's going to go through the Saturn square in the beginning of 2019, right around January, February. That's going to be an interesting time for him, and I think challenging in some ways. It'll be a challenging time. There could be some stuff that comes out about him. Um, what would that be? Might be MMA related. Maybe, maybe something along the lines that MMA is not on the up and up, or there's something about maybe drugs in MMA. There's something that comes out during this time, early, early 2019, that challenges him. It, there's all, I mean, it could also be this kind of, you know, this uh, sense of um, are they having to make another sacrifice or some kind of betrayal. Mm -hmm. He's got a test coming. He's got a major test. It, just, just circle the calendar. January, February 2019, Joe Rogan. Just remember that. Mm. Um, but he's, he's, he's trying to find something. He's trying to, uh, like, there's a level of validation that he's looking for. And it has to do with Saturn. There's also these in conjuncts in the chart with Mars and, and Venus, um, as well as some other planets. Anyway, um, could it be that this, the Saturnian figure that he's looking for is this authority that has now kind of superimposed itself on his show and is now guiding and directing him to the exact same thing like that was a brilliant insight that you had about him sort of being a trainer in some ways, mm -hmm. just like fight club. And stuff. I mean, there's, this is interesting stuff. He had Chuck Palahniuk on the other day, right? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what this is, right? It, that's this. And um, that's what we're in. And you know, like that's what, I mean, even when you, get down to the most conspiratorial thing to really talk about, which is cloning centers and shit like that. That is what is going on down there. It is fight club down there. And I know because I've been there. It's fight club. Wow. It's intense. <laughs> it, it's, it's fight club. It's pay for play. 
You know what I mean? Yeah, no, they kill each other. It's, you know what I mean? It's, it's, you know, like losing limbs and shit like that. Now it's happening in a holographic space. So it's a different kind of experience than, you know, what, what is portrayed in the movie, but that's a pretty good description of what's going on down there. You know, it's not pretty, you know, right. uh, you know, mm, there's a celebrity aspect to it. Donald Marshall sort of really, you know, pooped in the punch bowl on some of it and made it a little bit ridiculous, but a lot of things he says is right. But it's, you know, that's what's going on. So then Fight Club, I don't know, you know, I don't know to what level Chuck Palahniuk is aware that he either uh, wrote the script for them or that they, you know, that he wrote it because he was describing his own experience. I don't know how self-aware he is. Um, I, don't th I don't think you could write outside your experience. Yeah. I think, it's I think it's very difficult. Very, very difficult. Yeah. I mean, that movie, I mean, if, for those of you who have not seen Fight Club or those of you who have not seen it since, I, I should go back and watch it because I know so much more about what's going on in the world than the last time I saw it. Go watch that. It's all there. Oh, absolutely. It's all there. Um, absolutely. Okay, it so all there. it's all there. It, I, it, I, was, I was shocked when I saw it for the first time. Yeah, me too. I was, I was laying on, I was, so I had just moved back from Austin the first time, right? I'd lived in Austin for the first, a period, for the, like uh, about a year and a half. And somebody that was a very, very good friend of mine had, um, on the way, I, I was leaving Austin, I was coming back here. And as I, like in the days and weeks before I left, I stole my identity and stole a lot of money. Okay, like she was you know, into drugs and whatever. And she, she stole a lot of money. And so I was back here and all that shit was hitting the fan because like suddenly I'm like, I'm, what's going on? All these people are after me because I, you know, like I didn't, I, you know, I had to go through the whole, you know, uh, dealing with stolen identity kind of stuff. And of course it was a friend, it was harder. And I was, you know, I was very troubled at this time of my, in my life. I was into a lot of destructive behavior. And I went up to stay with my mom because my mom was near the beach for a couple of weeks to just try and get my head straight and try and, Pull my shit together and I just remember I was laying on the couch one day and like just laying there sideways in the middle of the afternoon not doing anything because that was what I was doing those days and Fight Club came on and I'm watching it and I'm like holy you know and that period of time in Austin had been one of my most active periods in terms of weird stuff going on and I'm sitting there watching that shit and I'm like I, I, I didn't I didn't know what to do you know what I mean I was just kind of like holy shit this is a fucking thing and I remember going to my therapist like a few days after I saw it and being like, that happens to me. I, I, didn't, and I didn't know anything at that point about MKUltra or mind control or any of this kind of stuff, but I knew that I had dissociative experiences. I, I didn't know that they were called that, but I was like, that what happened in the movie, that happens to me. And you know, it was many, many years before I figured out what was really going on, but that movie was a huge eye opener for me. You know? Yeah, well, <laughs> watch that movie, guys. Yeah, I'm sure triggered a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of it's brilliant. It's a brilliant film. Yeah, that's one of the few cases where I think the movie was better than the book. Interesting. I read the book as well. I, I love Chuck Palahniuk's book, but I think in that case, the movie was better than the book. Um, okay, so we kind of got off on a little side tangent there, but yes, the, it is interesting. It's like a, um, it's like a. Uh, I don't. I don't know if I have. So the does, does that make? Does it make Joe Rogan <clears throat> now an official gatekeeper, <clears throat> but in a different kind of way? It's so yeah. It, it, it's it. This is this is the new theater of mind control. Makes sense. This is the new MK Ultra theater. This is the new Woodstock. It makes sense um, <clears throat> because it, it, it has the semblance of having some <laughs> like layer or thread of truth or fiber, you know, that you can yeah. kind of munch on. It's got everything. It's got yeah. psychedelics. It's yeah. got music. It's got culture. It's got science. It's got technology. It's got archaeology. It's got all the stuff. Right, it, it, it's a completely fleshed out thing. It's got got the discussion of you know he had. I really like her. He had he had that a woman. I think her I can't remember her name now. Asian woman. Denise, Denise, talks about 
mm, she's a sexologist. She's like a sex researcher. She has interesting things to say. It, there's, there's so, there's all the elements that were there with the movements of the '60s, you know, of the late '60s. It's all there. It's just in a different high tech package, and it's yeah. coming from a jock instead of from, you know, a geek. Right, right. And there are so many young men who don't have kind of this strong father figure in their life. And he could, he, you know, he could play that role for them easily. Yeah. He talked about, you, he, you can tell how much he loves his daughters when he talks about his daughters. You know what I mean? So he has that sort of, he seems like he's probably a good parent. You know what I mean? He has that sort of, you know, yeah. Right. Which, I, yeah, absolutely. And even more reason to kind of leave, you know, conspiracy world behind. Yeah. And his, and, you know, he can easily justify that. Um, you want to talk about this Mike Baker guy? Into this, yeah, yeah. So if we're, if, the, if there's an operation being run here, then there's going to, there's, you know, there has to be mm, many people helping it along. And we're not in any way saying that this is the only one by any means, but this is an interesting character that has sort of popped up because he's been on the show several times. Robert, kind of take it away here. Well, so uh, you kind of brought this to my attention a little bit. There's this guy named Mike Baker who uh, is a former CIA, covert operations officer. Nobody ever leaves the CIA. No. Let's be clear about that. Nobody ever leaves the CIA. They may, they may be less involved. Nobody ever leaves. Um, and a lot of these guys have these security clearances. And they continue to um, use their security clearances because they're really good for them in business. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if Mike Baker still has a security clearance, um, but if he does, it would clearly help him in the private sector. So I just thought of something really funny too. <laughs> and it yeah. probably means nothing. His name is Mike Baker. So Joe Rogan sits there with the mic and is always getting people to adjust their mic and he gets everybody on his show baked. Mike Baker. There you go. It's true. <laughs> right. Absolutely. There's always the, there, there's always something like this in these things we talk about. Okay, go on. So Mike Baker, this is what it says here. He's born in England of all places. And yet he's CIA. So he's got international MI, MI5 too, right? No. Um, he's straight CIA, this guy. So um, he lives in Idaho. Utah? It says here, okay, so covert, for, former covert operations officer at CIA, president and co founder of Diligence, which is this company that is, you know, sort of a black cube kind of company. He lives in Idaho, and he's a script advisor, producer, former CIA officer, and security consultant. Spent 17 years covert field operations, Asia, Middle East. Um, he got his start on radio uh, with uh, Opie and Anthony. He was, he was on their show a lot. So, so he went from... That's part of the whole, like, can, it, Alex Jones is sort of somehow weirdly connected to them too, isn't he? He's connect, connected to Anthony Cumier. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, he has I, him I on the show. Guest the host. Yeah. But Anthony Cumier uh, was um, on Alex Jones quite a bit. He's a, he's a guest host a lot of times on, on yeah. Alex Jones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, he, he also shows up on Fox News a lot, this guy. Mm-hmm. So it gives you kind of a, you know, kind of a sense as to, you know, who he is and, you know, where he, you know, pops in. So Fox is going to be somewhat on the conservative tip. Um, he's kind of a technical advisor for them. Um, he's been on Greg Gutfeld's show. Mm -hmm. um, now he's, he's on Joe Rogan. At least four times. I could find four times. Five times, times since May of this year. He's been on five times since May of this year? Yeah. I thought I, I could find well, five times. I'm sorry, as of May 2018. Okay, so, so episode 541, 767, 
907. A thousand one and a thousand something. Thousand one 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 fifteen. Yeah. So five times. Five times. I think the only people that he's had on more than five times are his comedian friends like Duncan Trussell, Eddie Bravo, Joey Diaz, Ari Shafir. Those are the only people he's had on that many Brian, times. Brian Redband, isn't that another guy? Right, he has yeah. He's had his MMA, his ketogenic, and his comedy friends on. But in terms of like people outside of his regular social sphere that way, you know, he hasn't, you know, he's probably had Neil deGrasse Tyson on for three or four times at this point. So... Um, if I'm not mistaken, once this Mike Baker character started showing up, it probably began to dovetail with Rogan's distancing himself from conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. And 541, yeah, that's about it. That was about five years ago, six years ago. And um, even to the point now where he thinks like, like what happened with JFK was what, just what happened. Like there was nothing there, right? Like he's even yeah. done an about face on JFK. Am I really? right? I haven't heard that. Wow. That's that's what I've heard. Like my right? dad hasn't. My dad thinks there's something funny about the JFK. My dad is fully, you know, completely brainwashed idiot when it comes to government and all that stuff, right? My dad thinks there's something funny about JFK. Well, I think he's now leaning towards Rogan's leaning towards like you know the official story. <laughs> Okay. But if I'm not mistaken, I might be I might be wrong, but this is what I've been sort of reading about. So this Mike Baker guy seems to have come on the scene and Rogan has actually kind of addressed it. And he said um, that there are people who are claiming that he became a CIA sellout, a CIA show, the CIA got to him. And he talks about this on the show. Yeah. And he says, no, it's not the case. Well, I'm sure he thinks it's not the case. I'm sure he doesn't understand what's happening to him. That so the, the, yeah. you bring up an amazing point. And the amazing point is, is that he is being guided and sort of groomed and handled in a way yep. that he's not even fully aware of. Yep. And I, I would go out on a far enough on a limb to say that probably someone he trains with in the MMA world is probably, you know, a trainer as well. Robert, you've dropped way down. We can't see you at all. Where are you? You're like underneath the screen. What happened to me? There oh, you go. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Right? So, like, I, I, I'm sure that there are, you know, groomers or handlers or even just monitors in every aspect of his life. And he's into a lot of different stuff. You know, and, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be something nefarious, but there's people there who are influencing him. Yeah, well, if you were somebody like this guy, Mike Baker, who has this company, Diligence, mm -hmm. and, and you were running, like, operations for any number of clients. right. Would you want Joe Rogan, like, like, kind of in your fold? Yeah. So that you could... Well, it's kind of like Alex Jones is in the Stratford fold. Right. It's yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And we were looking at uh, the people that were connected to this diligence and the founders. Well, it, it was, I think it was initially called Due Diligence, right? And what right. an interesting name, right, for, for uh, just, dil you know, you think of Joe Rogan and he personifies that. He's really into this hardcore fighting and this diet and whatever. He's very diligent about everything that he does. Why would he not be an asset for a company called Diligence, whether he knows it or not? They're, they put it right there in front of your face. Everything is plain as day. Absolutely. So, so the non-executive chairman of Diligence is this guy, William Webster, who is the former director of the CIA and the FBI. Right, that's not a conflict of interest or anything. So this, this guy who's, you know, on the board or whatever, has really significant connections, even though he's like 95 years old and it's kind of a fossil. But mm -hmm. still, I mean, he's, you know, he's in the game. This guy's still in the game. He's got diligence. He definitely has some <laughs> diligence. <laughs> definitely. Um, 
So what's fascinating about the, these other three, two characters is a guy by the name of Trevor Williams and then Nick Day. And Nick Day is um, like MI5. I think it's Trevor, just Trevor Williams guy is MI5 too. So there's um, this interesting MI5 London connection. And even this Mike Baker guy who lives in the United States and um, lives in Idaho comes from London. So now, now we're into like, you know, Her Majesty's Secret Service and all that shit. And Joe Rogan is just one step removed from these characters who are basically agents of the crown. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and these idiots who he has on his show to debunk on conspiracies, they all have connections to those agencies too. Yeah. Well, th isn't Mike Baker one of his big debunkers? Well, there's the other guy who has like the Metabunk website that he has on all the time. Um, but think about it. Like the whole thing with like the Tom DeLong and the To the Stars, those are all like ex military and intelligence agency people, right? Mm hmm. And yeah. so when they have, when they're going to put a conspiracy theorist on, they don't put a smart one on, they put a dumb fuck like Tom DeLong, who works with people from the CIA and the intelligence agency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, he's so easily mocked in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stephen Greer? Yeah, I didn't see the Stephen Greer episode. And Stephen Greer can be intimidating on his own. Stephen Greer, there's, uh, Stephen Greer makes my skin crawl in a way. Oh, he's a, he's like, got a, like uh, a uh, creep, uh, creep factor of 10. Uh, creep, creep factor of 10. But he's another one of these guys that works out, you know. He, yeah, he's, he's got like, huge biceps, huge. Yeah, I mean, so who do you think could take one another? Do you think, you think Stephen Greer would stand a chance against Joe Rogan? Well, I think Stephen Greer probably has more – of kind of training, like Mossad maybe kind of training, like being able to kill somebody with a pen and a credit card, right? I think Stephen Greer is an alien. Probably. And I, and I think like, like he would like tap into like super alien strength. Yeah. And I, th I think Joe Rogan, it. Joe Rogan's Bigfoot and Stephen, Stephen, uh, Stephen uh, Greer is an alien. So he, he looks so freaking alien asking. He's so weird. Yeah, I, everything, I just, nothing can make my screen. I, it's hard to imagine someone making my skin crawl more than Stephen Greer. Um, so what was that exchange like? I, di I didn't see that one. I, I, know, I watched a little bit of it. It was several years ago now. I have no interest in Stephen Greer or anything he talks about. So I was just watching for like the, you know, voyeurism aspect of it, you know, and I don't really remember. But, you know, it was... He obviously is more intelligent and made more sense than Tom DeLonge or, you know, Steven Tyler about this kind of stuff. Um, but it was, you know, it was several years back. So Joe wasn't mocking quite as hard as he's mocking now, but he was mocking. Steven Tyler, he made poor Steven Tyler look senile. Well, I mean, it's not hard, but. <laughs> oh, I want to talk about the exchange with Shooter Jennings, too. Right. So this, we got into this when I watched the interview with Shooter Jennings and I was like, Robert, go watch this. This is when I noticed be between the thing with Shooter Jennings and the interaction with Candace Owens about climate change, it didn't work. It worked, this, it worked better with Shooter Jennings. Joe Rogan has moved into being a handler himself. If you watch, guys, go watch that episode from last week with Shooter Jennings, like, last week, like a week and a half ago maybe, right? And watch what Joe Rogan does to him. Like Shooter Jennings is just asking fair questions for somebody who does not believe, you know, the, the agreed upon consensus story, right? He yeah, I, mean, I, th I, th I think it was like Sandy Hook, 9-11. But they were, it, was just, it was general stuff. He wasn't getting into the super weird shit that you and me and Ray, he wasn't getting into any Cameron Caskey kind of shit or anything like that, right? It was right. just typical like first level of questions like what this is weird this is weird this is weird he was basically also just defending alex's jones uh, um uh right to exist you know what i mean and to speak and joe rogan handled him to the point where he couldn't even make sense anymore like the words he was saying no longer made sense because joe rogan got him all twitter pated and that is how you handle somebody you know what i mean i watched him do it and he was trying to do it to candace owens and it didn't work you know what i mean but it worked with Shooter Jennings. And he's had Shooter Jennings on the show a couple of times, 
right? Shooter Jennings is interested. He's an interesting guy. He's a music student. He's the son of Waylon Jennings, the famous country music star. You know, and he's one of these kind of weird sort of libertarian guys who, you know, has some, you know, open to conspiracies and whatever. But he's, you know, and why did Joe Rogan have to do that? Why did you have to take this guy and make him look like a fucking idiot? Why? Why? Is that- in his, it's in his chart. It's that seventh house. Yeah. And the domination of Scorpio at the seventh house in the South Node. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, of course, that's going to happen. It's what he does. It's what he did to Jan Irvin. Jan yeah, Irvin is smart, though. Like, well, Jan Irvin can at least smart, put up a fight. Shooter Jennings was like, they had no, they had no chance. So Eddie, Eddie Bravo and Shooter Jennings, their, their, their birthdays are separated by four days. Oh, that's interesting. They're, they're, both, um, they're both Tauruses. So Shooter Jennings was born May 19th. I remember seeing this. I, look, I looked up his chart a little bit. And then Eddie Bravo is um, May 15th. I think May 15th is, is it Dennis Robbins' birthday? Mm. Might be. Um, let me make sure. Yeah, May 15th. So they're separated by four days, which means both their sons are in, in his first. So they would be prominent people in Joe Rogan's life. Anybody who's Taurus is going to be a prominent person in Joe Rogan's life. He's going to, he's going to, uh, I wouldn't say use them, but anytime somebody's son is in your first house, like you are amping on their energy. Hmm. You're oh, he definitely amps on Eddie Bravo's energy. He loves getting all worked up with Eddie Bravo and all that kind of stuff. He loves that. Yeah. Yeah. But like, like you said, though, he hasn't been on a show for a while. I, I mean, he was on not that long ago. He still hasn't come. Like that's, this, and this is where it's interesting, right? Like, and this is where I think there is a part of Joe Rogan that, is sincere it's like okay i'm still gonna let these topics be talked about which for some people is the gateway opening you know what i mean so he still lets the topics be talked about you know and then it's up to you and that's the same thing with all this shit right like you're in trouble if you believe alex jones it's it's a it's not it's your you you know you're not going to end up in a good place but if you take the initiative of taking something you heard on alex jones and starting to do your own research and becoming an autodidact then eventually you will find your way to something that closer resembles the truth. And that's the same here. Joe Rogan and Alex Jones are the head and the tail of the dragon. They're doing the same thing on the opposite end of the animal. Yeah. It's, certainly, it's, they are for now. certainly they are for now. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Dennis Rodman, May 13th. So two days before Eddie, Eddie, uh, Eddie Bravo. Just in yeah. case you were wondering at home. Yeah, you know, so Eddie, Eddie, I mean, Eddie Bravo is, you know, Eddie Bravo is not dumb, but he, because of his personality and how he gets so hyped up and whatever, it's easy to kind of make him look crazy too. But if you actually listen to the content of what Eddie Bravo says, it's, you know, it's not, it, there's some, you know, he obviously has done a fair amount of research and he doesn't know everything and he'll say that himself, but he's just not buying it. He doesn't say he knows what the answer is. He just feels like he knows what the answer isn't. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I don't no, understand. I agree. What- That's actually a pretty, pretty good position to have. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, you know, and he's got an interest, you know, because he's a jujitsu master, he likes to have something to sort of push against, to fight back against, to sort of, you know, like that's sort of what jujitsu is all about is is resist, you know, like taking the resistance of something. So that's in his personality. Um, And it is interesting how they maintain this close friendship when at this point, yeah, Eddie Bravo thinks something funny is going on with Joe, but they're still friends. Yeah. 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 So, wow. what's next for Joe Rogan? I mean, where do you think? I mean, he's 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 blowing. He's pretty big. He's got the most I popular think he's podcast. At the in absolute the world. peak, right? And right now, I think the next, you know, for about the last six months and the f- six months going forward, I mean, Joe, there is no more pivotal person in information right now. I think than Joe Rogan, and I think that you know, I don't, I don't dissuade people from. What, there's lots of interesting stuff there. I get. I there's good information there. But there's also a program. There's also an agenda. There's also a regimen. You know what I mean? And so, you know, there's a lot of people out there, especially like, you know, liberals who just left the reservation or sort of mm, libertarian minded people who are afraid to dive into the conspiracy kind of stuff that they're like, they're real into Joe Rogan. So you, you need to, you cannot, and this goes for anything. This goes for information from anyone, including me and from Robert. Go look into shit yourself. 
don't take it hook, line, and sinker. And, you know, if you find yourself, I mean, you know, doing everything that Joe Rogan does and, you know, buying into all the lifestyle stuff, ask yourself what that's really about. I'm not saying don't have the experiences, right? But it's pretty funny how he's popularized all of this stuff while he's been taking people. So part of the reason you give people psychedelics and put them in a tank, and it's like shamanic initiation kind of stuff, right? You're going to take them on a journey. He has taken people on a journey from not questioning things to questioning things and then back to not questioning them again. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, don't worry, you know, don't, don't go over there. Yeah. yeah it's not, nothing it's is just true. unfuckable white guys over there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although there are some amazing, absolutely amazing, like, black conspiracy researchers. Mm -hmm. Progress, Professor Griff, Rick Griffin from... Yeah, he's good. Larry Dr. Pinkney, Larry Pinkney, the former Black Panther, he's good. Dr. Phil Valentine, there's another yeah. guy. Lennon Honor, Seven Bomar. Seven Bomar is interesting. Raz yeah, whatever, Ben. Whatever happened to Lennon Honor? Sonia Barrett. Sonia Barrett. Whatever happened to Lennon Honor? He's around. He's always at the like free your mind and stuff like that. You know, he's good. Seven's great. Raz Ben is someone that I've been turned on to recently. He's very interesting. Um, trying to think of who else. There's a lot. Yeah, it's not, you know, for on a certain level, Freeway Ricky Ross was able to learn enough to get himself out of jail. He's a conspiracy researcher. Well, he, he, he studied law when he was in yeah. prison, right? And conspiracy, because that's what he was part of, you know? This, this was a guy who was illiterate when he went into prison. Yeah. Pretty, pretty amazing. So, yeah, no, uh, you know, that's, it's, it, it's not that. It's, yeah, you know, I mean, I think that that's just a generalized broad swipe, and it's, it's kind of like, you know, so it's like, okay, I've taken a dump on my past and I'm moving on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and also- well, It's interesting to see how this thing plays out with him. Yeah. And- um, Well, this has been fun doing this with you. you really yeah, interesting. It's, it's good little rabbit hole. And, and, I, and I, I thought, uh, I thought your, your insight as to how he's becoming like this conductor in this kind of massive new NK Ultra operations, pretty brilliant. Yeah, pretty brilliant. I can. <laughs> well, it takes somebody who who's been in that world to understand that. Yeah. To see it. So. Yeah. You know, and he was when I when I was just on the edge, like when I was just starting to figure it out, was about the time his podcast showed up and started getting real popular. So it's entirely possible that this was planned all along because they knew people like me were coming. You know what I mean? And so yeah. catch them. Yeah. And also because I think the, again, the, the conspiracy world, <coughs> it's, you know, now it's a limited hang mm -hmm. and they're, they're just, they're pulling up the stakes. Oh, on a certain level, I'm bored of it too, but yeah. I'm not bored of it because it's not the truth. I'm bored of I it. I agree because, with you. Yeah. I, the, the challenge with the conspiracy stuff, and I, I, was, I was talking about this on Friday on my show, is that if, like, if you get into Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky, he talks about, you know, these um, actions. Like when people would go out and community organize, they'd have an action. Mm -hmm. They called it. Taking an action. Yep. If the action would begin to lose energy, it was time to... Abandon it and move to something else. That's right. Yep. I've read so, those radicals. <laughs> we're, we're kind of seeing that in the Rogan world. That's my sense. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right, kids. Well, this has been a fan, another, it's always wonderful with you, Robert. You guys go to robertphoenix.com. He's going to be back with 15 minutes of flame next week. He's got Friday forecast going, Sunday night, 11th house. It's lots of fun. Go hang out in the chat room over there. Sometimes I'm over there in the chat room. And um, we'll do this again real soon. Thank you, Robert. Thanks for having me on, Emily. Always All great. Totally All great. right, guys. Yeah. The truth is out there. It's inside of you. You're not going to find it on the Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> Although I like watching it. Have a good one, guys. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.